Cheers. All right, let's get um, Twitch pulled up, and we should be uh, we should be going live shortly. Oh no, I have to restart the Twitch app. There we go, live. All right, let's see. Do we have audio? Testing. Oh, no, I have to restart the Twitch app. Awesome. All right, we even have audio. Whew. Okay, we have 49 viewers. Um, we are rolling. Um, yeah, let's let's roll. All right, uh, ASU people, quick uh, check any any uh, issues, questions, comments before we get started. Nobody. All right, someone do a, a, a voice check to make sure we have um, Twitch audible um, audio from us. Yeah, sure. All right, that should be sufficient. Let's make sure that it comes across on Twitch. Yeah, it worked. Oh, nice. How are you uh, watching with so little latency? That's, that's impressive. I'm just a professional stream watcher, man. Damn. Man, a streamer. Imagine being a streamer. Yeah, all he right. said stream watcher. We're all, all right, right, right. we're all streamers now, so everyone on this uh, Zoom call is streaming. Cool. All right. So, welcome to um, the outro of ASU's Applied Vulnerability Research course. Um, what uh, is going to happen is I'll give a quick kind of a summary of uh, the course, and then the students themselves are going to uh, give you their experiences in the course um, and their accomplishments, which is super exciting for everybody involved, especially me. The semester is over. DEF CON quals is next weekend, and uh, then I can maybe sleep. Awesome. All right. So um, without uh, further ado, let's um, get started. Uh, oh, awesome. We got chat going on, so I'll monitor the chat, the the uh, Twitch um, chat, and I'll try to answer questions um, as effectively as I can while the students are talking. Um, and it'll be it'll be pretty good. All right. So um, first, some uh, background. Right. This class started out uh, when um, we decided to teach hacking skills to. Uh, um, uh, students. I mean, obviously, cybersecurity is a big, important field, and so it's important to have students that understand cybersecurity concepts when they graduate. And uh, every school is adding cybersecurity to their curriculum, and it's an important, um, you know, thing, of course. But uh, at ASU, we wanted to go a little bit further. We want to go um, very hands-on. We want to graduate students that are very competent in cybersecurity concepts and could actually go on and do cybersecurity professionally. Um, and uh, this kind of goes all the way back to uh, the inspiration for the creation of Pwn College. Um, and of course, inspiration one, when you're talking about teaching cybersecurity is the classroom. You say, all right, we're gonna make cool cybersecurity classes and that's great, that's important, but it's not, um, you know, sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, uh, the traditional classes, they have um, drawbacks. People tend to just absorb information passively. Classes usually have one or two, you know, assignments and, you know, you do one or two buffer overflows and then you do it, you forget it, you move on. All right. And uh, honestly, traditional classes don't scale so well to, to really teaching students that, that you know, um, require uh, a lot of uh, explanation, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so then there's another um, source of inspiration for us, and that source of inspiration is Capture the Flag competitions. Of course, um, at ASU, we're very heavily involved uh, in Capture the Flag. Um, our students uh, participate in CTF competitions as Team Shellfish. Uh, most of the professors um, uh, we, we actually are members of the Order of the Overflow, so we host DEF CON CTF. I mean, we're, we're 
very passionate about capture the flag competition. Of course, we when I started as a professor, I said, okay, let's use capture the flag to teach cybersecurity. But typically, students get overwhelmed. Capture the flag explores very, very cutting edge concepts. Doesn't hold punches. Uh, even easy capture the flag competitions are not very approachable for beginners in cybersecurity. And so then we said, okay, well, there's this other thing, this um, kind of uh, concept called war games. You go to pwnable.kr and you, um, you know, work through the exercises. Uh, the problem is that uh, most of the students I've seen trying to learn cybersecurity through war games, they um, become unmotivated eventually. And uh, it, it doesn't quite work out. So um, we decided to do better. We created a uh, platform that tried to fix the things that were wrong with other ways of cybersecurity education that had gradual learning curves that CTFs lack, that provide plenty of repetition, that classes lack, uh, guidance that war games lack, motivations that everything lack, and that scales, right, to teach a lot of students. and. The um, platform is based on the concept of wax on, wax off. In other words, practice makes perfect. In Karate Kid, a very important uh, movie to um, CTF culture, uh, the main character learns karate initially through uh, household chores. You know, wax on, wax off becomes block, block, right? Um, and uh, eventually, without quite realizing it, the main character is a proficient practitioner of martial arts. Cool. So we did the same thing. Um, and of course, once we got martial arts in, in the brain, um, we kind of ran with it. We realized that, hey, uh, students at different stages of their development, and this you know kind of came across from our, that initial uh, concept, were, um, uh, were, were, were at, at, you know, had different needs educationally and we kind of split these into white belts that start are just starting out yellow belts that have some experience you know they can they can do blocks um, but from a CTF perspective let's say they do 100 level 100 point level challenges blue belts that have some advanced co uh, knowledge of concepts 200 level challenges and so forth then brown belts which are you know competent practitioners um, they're like cybersecurity professionals and you know black belts who are, um, you know, winning significant prize at Ponto and so forth. And so we split this into kind of five stages of education. We realized that at different stages, there's different ways to optimally guide people, right? So, you know, traditional computer science classes get you to the white belt level. Then from the yellow belt level onwards, you can start playing CTS without being too frustrated and war games without being too frustrated, but beforehand, there wasn't a good resource and boom, that's what we did. A white belt to yellow belt um, platform called Pwn Collar. So that's me summarizing last semester for those that didn't know about Pwn Collar, didn't know about ASU's cybersecurity education um, you know, approach. And now let's talk about well, actually, first, let's talk about what we went through in Pwn College. So what the, the prerequisites were for this course. And then we'll talk about the course. And Pwn College covered kind of this hands-on concepts in cybersecurity and specifically binary exploitation um, to, to, to pick a topic, right? Um, and we went through uh, concepts like shell coding, sandboxing, reverse engineering, memory errors, and, and onwards, right? Uh, and, and then advanced exploitation techniques, um, kernel security. It, it was all good stuff. And the very last week of Pwn College, we actually tackled in a very initial small way, automatic vulnerability discovery. Um, so Pwn College was great people. Well, I don't know. I made it so, you know, I can, I can, I, I hope it was great, but uh, people seem to really, really like it. Um, and it uh, was already, um, uh, you know, it, it made a splash. People uh, are using it, by the way. It is online, uh, available for free. If you didn't notice that last uh, sentence, so you can go to pwn.college and actually practice with all of these uh, concepts uh, with, with my lecture videos from last semester um, and uh, the Discord channel 
if you run into problems. But Pwn College definitely felt like we were still playing in a sandbox. Right? There's still this question of, but what is next? How do I get out of the sandbox? I'm very proficient in my sandbox. But where do I move on? Right? And specifically, people were interested in uh, two things. One, how do I move on to become a master class CTFer? And two, how do I get into the cybersecurity industry? How do I use these skills to actually um, you know, make a difference in the real world? And that is why I created this course. Um, of course, the philosophy of Pwn College is practice makes perfect. Right? It's the philosophy of Karate Kid. It's good enough for Karate Kid. It's good enough for us. So practice makes perfect. Let's practice being cybersecurity professionals in the real world. Specifically, let's pick one uh, cybersecurity um, career field, and that career field is going to be vulnerability research. So before I dive in, I'm gonna take one second to read the Twitch stream. Uh, let's see, boom. All right, all right. Um, cool, so we're, we're, we don't have any ma massive uh, questions on Twitch, so we'll just move on. All right, so we decided to create a vulnerability research class at Arizona State University. So this spawned uh, CSE 598, Applied Vulnerability Research. And the idea was that we would create a little student-led vulnerability research lab. We'd find targets to analyze for software vulnerabilities, real-world targets, plan analysis approaches, find vulnerabilities, develop proof concept exploits, responsibly disclose the problems and, and get them fixed. Right? And so this, this uh, of course, was the initial plan. Um, the class is very experimental. I, I don't want to say this is like the first such class. Uh, I don't know if it is, but um, it's definitely, um, I'm not aware of other classes quite like it. So um, of course we ran into growing pains. Um, the initial uh, schedule was uh, very, uh, kind of demarcated, and I knew that it would uh, we would stray from it. Um, the general idea we would spend a couple of weeks picking the target, spend a couple of weeks analyzing the target for vulnerabilities, and we'd have a ton of vulnerabilities. Then we'd have like uh, you know a quick triage process, and we plan our exploitation. We spend a couple of weeks exploiting them. We have the exploit, and then we we go submit um, these uh, issues. Uh, through the dis responsible disclosure process. So that was uh, going to be very nice and organized. The actual uh, schedule uh, was different. So we had quite a uh, chaotic, uh, everything was happening all at the same time for a number of reasons that I'll, um, and, and the students will discuss because vulnerability research is not such a, you know, simple step-by-step um, -step process. So, We'll just go quick through the concepts of the class and then onwards to the students themselves. So first, the targets, right? The software that we were going to analyze. Um, we had very few ground rules. One, um, we uh, wanted that software to be used by real people, right? If, if the software isn't actually used in the real world, then, uh, you know, why bother analyzing it, right? The software must have been, it must be actively maintained. So active software in which we have a hope of getting these issues fixed. And uh, the security story must be plausible, right? So, uh, you know, you don't want to find bugs in LS. Uh, I mean, there could be security stories in LS, but but really, optimally, you, you, you find bugs in something that people will care about being buggy um, or being vulnerable specifically. Um, and of course we learned some lessons here. I won't, uh, you know, take the wind out of the student sale, but, uh, but there's a lot of, uh, good, um, lessons that the different, uh, teams learned throughout the whole process. Um, all right, then, um, we decided to, or, uh, then of course we needed to analyze the software we picked. Um, we expected, I expected a lot of fuzzing. That's kind of the king right now of um, software uh, vulnerability research. Um, and we got a lot of fuzzing, not 
exclusively fuzzing, but a lot of it. Um, through this process in analyzing in general, I definitely identified some gaps in ASU's curriculum, right? Sanitizers, even though I said we did a really quick crash course in um, last semester in automated vulnerability analysis, we uh, actually didn't discuss sanitizers at all. This was kind of a, a, a big oversight and, and it needs to uh, be included. Uh, triaging bugs, um, students were, um, almost everybody was quickly overwhelmed with, with crashes. Um, and even when they weren't overwhelmed with crashes, they were, there was significantly a significant challenge to figure out why crashes occur and, and track them down to um, root causes to fix. Um, and uh, sysops, actually, interestingly, was a huge hurdle. We had um, a lot of this analysis uh, scaled out um, using uh, Kubernetes and so forth, and, and it was uh, uh, quite daunting for the students to approach this. Um, some significant percentage of the time was spent uh, learning you know, the intricacies of fuzzing in Docker, Kubernetes, and stuff like that. So it was uh, pretty interesting lessons learned. Of course, the students in their uh, presentations are after mine, have a lot more of these. Um, the bugs, of course, we, we got plenty of bugs. Um, our primary interest initially was code execution, but we plan to you know disclose other bugs as well. And the original plan was that we would bulk disclose bugs in, in you know, all at once at the end of the semester. But this very specifically had to change because we quickly started finding that, you know, we find bugs and then, and then they get scooped out from under us. Um, all right. So, um, uh, th there's a lot of lessons learned about bugs and triaging bugs and et cetera, et cetera. I'll let the, the students talk about that. Then, um, uh, exploitation, right? Originally, Exploitation was a core part of the class. We were gonna uh, create exploits um, so that, you know, to show the security relevance of the bugs. But uh, when we started submitting bugs upstream as soon as possible, um, as soon as we were done triaging with them to, to you know, ensure that, that impact, um, it made this very interesting fundamental <clears throat> difference in that students started thinking of these bugs as kind of old. Right, and then who wants to, <clears throat> excuse me. And they didn't uh, want to spend subconsciously like so much time um, exploiting these old bugs and they will move on and find more bugs. So every team uh, prioritized finding more bugs over exploiting the bugs they had, um, which is a very interesting takeaway. And, and actually uh, from a pedagogical perspective um, in terms of curriculum design, I think it's it's very clear that this sort of advanced exploitation techniques is a different route of cybersecurity than uh, bug hunting in general, um, which probably in future semesters we'll have a kind of this class more defined on finding the bugs, maybe a different class on exploiting real world bugs. All right, <clears throat> then, um, the disclosure process, um, the plan, of course, was to responsibly disclose all of these bugs, and, and that's what we did. A lot of lessons learned here. I'll, I'll let the students uh, talk about that as well. All right, uh, one thing we did um, over the course of the semester, it had real-world visitors um, visit us and uh, spread their um, experiences, um, their wisdom. Uh, and this was super, super useful. Um, and we had uh, we had people from different sectors of the industry, people with, with just different um, vulnerability research experience, and they jumped in. Um, some of them stayed for multiple sessions um, and, and, and uh, uh, Jeff specifically, I have to shout out to him for holding office hours with my students. Um, and, and which was super, super helpful to them to, to see gaps in their analysis plan and, and, and uh, break through beyond that. Super awesome. Thank you everybody for uh, dropping in and making that, uh, to all of our visitors for uh, making this um, uh, that much more successful class. That was awesome. All right, so um, the hackers, let's talk about the students themselves and then we'll roll on to um, you know the uh, the results and then and, and some memes and so forth and then their presentation so the hackers um 
I required for this class an A plus in uh, in, in Poem College, roughly equivalent to a blue belt. You can actually get an A plus in uh, the class without quite getting your blue belt. So everyone was either blue belt or like right right there, one challenge away or something, right? Um, or alternatively, for graduate students that that you know came to ASU, uh, Poem College is an undergraduate course here. For graduate students, um, if if they you know were confident in the the appropriate skills, uh, they could also take. So so my graduate students also took this class. Um, we had twenty students in the class, and we split up into five teams of four. Um, and we had team airspace, conclusion, syntax, transmitter, and unconquerable. I made those names. What I do is I take a random. Um, uh, word from user share dict um and then i keep doing it until i find a word that ideally can't really be uh misconstrued as as kind of a a, a dick like you can imagine it it comes back as team dummy that's not good so we have you know these five awesome teams um and these five awesome teams um made a lot of great memes um so part way through our uh uh class of course the whole um game stock uh stuff exploded and dogecoin exploded and uh, it was it was pretty awesome um we had you know several classes full of these sort of memes um we had never ending uh belittling of the professor for insisting that the stack grows horizontally which is the actual truth if you um are joining us from a non pwn college background go look in my lectures it makes total sense if you grow the stack horizontally um some of the cves that were submitted uh during the class actually then popped up in uh github's depend the bot alerts for example um and specifically team shellfish which got auto corrected to shellfish at uh some point had some infrastructure on uh github that was notified of a pillow CVE that uh, the students in this class found and submitted. So that was pretty cool. Um, and so what about the outcome, right? Well, we, everybody, all the teams found real bugs in real software used by real people, right? Um, not everyone got CVEs for them. Not every bug was, uh, you know, a critical code execution uh, potential bug. Plenty of null drafts and etc. But you know the real uh, bugs are the friends we made along the way. But but it was uh, everyone got a lot of hands-on cybersecurity experience, and that is great. Um, and so there's there's a lot of tools, a lot of knowledge that hopefully is coming out of this class. And my feeling is a lot of these students can basically now smoothly step right out of ASU and right into a vulnerability research lab and be a good uh, junior contributor. And that would be very rewarding to me if that was actually the case. All right. So uh, with that, that's the kind of introduction to the course. Now we're going to go on to the student um, sections unless people on Twitch have questions. So let's pause for 10 seconds. Um, and see questions while we're paused, actually. Um, who is uh, going first from the student presentation? I know I, uh, Team Syntax asked to go first, and then some other people have other time constraints. So who has the tightest time constraints? Is it Team Syntax? Uh, if no other teams want to go first, then we can do it. Cool. Well, let's give it 10 seconds for someone to speak up and oh, then okay. Team Syntax goes. No questions on Twitch. Awesome. Oh, one question was, is this going to be a summer course? Uh, no, it's actually tricky to run these small courses over the summer just the way that the university does accounting um so uh, csc 466 is a fall course and then this will likely remain um a spring course as a follow-up or we'll 
you know, decided it was a terrible idea and never do it again. One of those. Um, will Pwn College 2021 also be held on uh, live streams? Yeah, uh, that's the plan. That being said, ASU is going back to in-person instruction, so the live stream is probably going to be, you know, me standing up in the classroom. I have to make sure that all of this works. Um, I, I'll get a microphone with good noise cancellation so that, you know, uh, we can uh, deal with a, a, a classroom environment. Um, but yeah, that's that's my plan right now. It'll be in the classroom, but not in, in or sorry, it'll be live stream, but not from this room. It'll be live stream from um, class. And now I'm currently planning to keep the same offline lectures and then uh, kind of live uh, extended Q&A. Cool. All right. Uh, let's roll onwards um, with Team Syntax. So I'm going to stop my share and then actually let me enable screen sharing. And hopefully this doesn't break anything. All right, Team Syntax, take it away. Okay. Be honest. Hello. All right. Uh, can everyone hear me? All right. Yep. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So, uh, hi. How's it going, everyone? Uh, my name is Luke Schaefer, and I'm part of uh, Team Syntax, as you can see here. Uh, yeah. Oh. We can go to the all right. So yeah, here are, um, here's a little bit about us. We're a, we're a team of four students from uh, ASU of you know masters and PhD students. There's our names. Uh, my name is my name is Luke, and yeah, let's uh, let's go ahead and uh, and get started. So we were pretty excited about this class, but uh, to get started in the in the whole process of uh, software vulnerability. Uh, research, we were pretty keenly aware of our limitations, both in the uh, the knowledge front and also on the time front. You know, normally you you don't really have a, a set deadline for these sorts of things, and we knew that everything that we were doing had to be done within the course of a, a college semester. And uh, and on top of that, we knew that none of us were professionals to begin with, and so uh, what was already a tight time constraint was was made a little bit more pressing because of uh, how much onboarding and, and you know the, the learning curve that we would have to have to uh, overcome and so with these sorts of constraints in mind we uh, we tried to, to lower the the bar for entry as, as much as possible and pick something nice and easy and simple to conceptualize so that we'd be able to make uh, some like quick and steady progress going forward with the class and so one thing we quickly settled on was um, image processing libraries since you know you don't really need any complicated structure or, you know you don't need to diagram anything you just know that okay this library takes in some data interprets it as an image you know does stuff and it's, it's all very easy to conceptualize for uh you know someone to, to look at without having to dive too deep into it so after an, an initial kind of uh rough spread of ideas that were thrown out thrown around we, uh, we ended up picking two main image processing libraries to, uh, to begin our initial search with. First one was PIL slash PILO, the Python library, and then uh, which was our pretty much our main focus, turned into our main focus over the course of the semester. And then the second one was, uh, was GDAL, which we, we kind of worked with a little bit, but uh, nothing, nothing really appreciable in terms of uh, in comparison to PILO. And so we actually got pretty lucky with our selection of Pillow. Um, first of all, because uh, there's this Google project called OSS Fuzz, which is basically, um, it's just a, a, a framework that Google has put together for continuous uh, security fuzzing of open source projects where they've gone through and they've set up all the infrastructure, of, you know, doing, doing the containers and getting all the fuzzing infrastructure in place. So that uh, basically all someone needs to do to contribute or uh, also work with these projects is just clone the repository down, follow the step-by-step -step instructions for each project, and then uh, basically you'll be able to just start fuzzing things on your own machine 
uh, just, you know, right away, just, you know, by following these nice step-by-step -step instructions. And so since Pillow was already included in that project, it, uh, it helped us a lot in the beginning when we were just trying to, you know, figure out where we were going and, you know, what was make heads and tails of, of things. And so the fact that it was a nice structured layout for us really, really helped things. But also, the, on the other, you know, the downside of that is since it was already integrated in this, in this project for continuous, you know, fuzzing and, you know, looking for security vulnerabilities, our hopes really weren't too high about being able to get anything out of it since, you know, it's in the, it's in the project by Google looking for security vulnerabilities. And so we, we tried to keep realistic about, uh, you know, the sort of stuff we'd be able to find out of it. So, yeah. Okay, so then a little background about Pillow for uh, just anyone that isn't familiar. Pillow is a, it's the friendly fork of the Python imaging library. That was, uh, it's basically, I, 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 I'd venture to say it's pretty ubiquitous in terms of image processing in Python. Like if you, if you do any sort of image processing with Python, Odds are you're going to be using Pillow or something that uh, that depends on Pillow. It supports like a million different image formats, and there's a uh, close to half a million public repositories that depend on Pillow to uh, to serve their image processing needs. And so, with that with that kind of status, we thought Pillow would be a, a very fun target, and you know, shooting for the stars. If we were able to get anything out of Pillow, we thought that would uh that would just really be pretty awesome. And so, uh, yeah, without further ado, we can uh, go ahead and get started and tell you guys how we, um, how we started analyzing it. All right, so the first step was to find a fuzzing engine and through OSS fuzz, we found Aetherus, um, which is a Python fuzzing engine. Uh, so Aetherus was originally written based on libfuzzer. So it was only capable of fuzzing native code such as C and C++, but uh, it was later expanded to be able to fuzz, fuzz Python code as well. Um, but since Pillow, uh, we are trying to fuzz Pillow Imaging Library, which is written in C, uh, Aetherus native code fuzzing uh, capabilities came in super handy. And so um, how it would work would be uh, Aetherus would call an entry point um, using this function, um, as you can see in the example, uh, Aetherus.setup function will um, call an entry point and then um, it will uh, initialize when we, when we call aetherus.fuzz. And so um, when aetherus uh, initializes, it will need to um, send in coverage uh, data back to libfuzzer um, for libfuzzer to process. And so um, how it works is that Python uses, uh, Python has this, uh, uh, low level support for tracing um, called uh, pi, val, pi eval set trace. Um, and it would call this um, API uh, to um, be able to uh, basically track code execution. Um, and when there's a function callback, Aetherus would then call these um, sanitizer APIs. So there's sanitizer, uh, cov, uh, uh, PC in it, and then sanitizer cov 8-bit uh, counter in it. And it would use these APIs to send coverage information back to libfuzzer. And so um, this way we could use libfuzzer directly with Python. And um, Etheris also supports uh, different address sanitizers, which we are also able to use, um, and also undefined behavior sanitizers. Um, next. All right, so our plan of attack was pretty simple. So it was basically um, run the first harness, um, deploy it on the cluster, and then analyze the code coverage, um, see what um, functions were covered, see what we can improve, and then uh, add a new harness, and then just repeat this process um, until we can get caches, which was uh, fairly early on, as we'll explain later. Um, so we'll take a look at our first harness which is really simple. Um, basically, it takes in some uh, data, um, an image 
format, um, and then it would open it, rotate some image, the image in 45 degrees, uh, apply some filters, and then save it. And that was it. And then we would call either as fuzz, and um, it would start fuzzing. Um, and then uh, next, we'll talk about uh, how we um, basically uh, analyzed code coverage. So our next step is trying to get the source code coverage, uh, which OS Fuzz and Clang already have nice support of generating the source code coverage report. And, but we tried it, it failed for these strange issues that is that Python projects can only be fast with address sanitizer and, and undefined behavior sanitizer only. And this looks strange because um, based on our understanding before about at the risk that uh, there's nothing special about Python or other stuff in, in this project that uh, Python is still written in C and same as Pillow and, or any other native library. So we thought it should be easy to support the coverage sanitizer. So we continue to try to solve these issues by going through the OS fast source code coverage generation process. Uh, and first we comment out that line that is stopping us and then uh, this is a few steps that OSFAS uh, uses to generate this coverage report. And uh, first, it uses LLVM prop data. On the first, it uh, just changed the compile flags into this coverage sanitizer. Which in this step, Pillow's project works fine that it can be compiled in these flags successfully. And uh, here's the last step where the error happened after some manually trying. We found the issue is that this object argument, um, normally it receives the compiled binary, but for Python project, uh, when it's a Python script or in OS fast way, to compile the Python script into a binary by UI installer. That uh, Clang just can't map the source code to the coverage information. So, so this is why this line gets errored and we can't get the source code coverage report. So once we know that this argument is the issue, the solution gets clear that we need to find the raw compiled binary to pass it to LVM code. Uh, so in Pillow's case, it's this imaging shared library installed in uh, Python. So once these issues get solved, we can get the coverage report and we start to look into it. And then after uh, that we had these points to be improved in our mind, that our uh, first um, is uh, we found that our existing harness, uh, well, their existing harness only are uh, only testing the code part of, the, of pillow but it means the encode part uh, of whatever image format in its source code. And uh, next, it also means some image operation code. And also this report is generated by C is running for like uh, 40 hours. So it's very large and somehow we guess it somehow slowed it further. So we met the issue of uh, the father has too many C's to. Therefore, uh, we did these improvements. Uh, that first, we split C's uh, by a dump way uh, according to the, the image format. That it's a dumb way to do C classification, but uh, it turns out to be effective to um, utilize our big server and, and it did find crashes faster. 
And then we go through Pillow's documentation to add more APIs to our harness, like some operation called uh, draw, prop, merge, uh, etc. cetera. And once we have few different harness running, we can use the same way to compare our coverage report. So this is the former one I showed before, and so and next this is the new coverage uh, report. So it looks obvious that now our new harness is testing more code. So this is the basic process of of our buzzing loop, and, and this way it sounds easy, right? Since uh, we just need to write some Python code and writing Python takes nearly no time. So we just can't control ourselves to try it on other Python stuff, other Python modules. And here is the same steps we try. Uh, so still, we still start from some simple harness that there are modules like compress and decompress and JSON and pickle. And there are also modules like uh, of CSV and socket stuff. And uh, I noticed that they are all Python internal library. So we have to compile Python from source code with uh, clan instrumentation and use the same way to find their shared library. Here it's uh, installed in this dynamic load directory, uh, which uh, when you or import any library in Python, it will dynamically load this shared library. So um, by using the same way, we, uh, according to the coverage report, we can see that uh, our very simple harness is really testing the Python code very well. Uh, so, but so far for this part, for this Python module part, we haven't come up with any result so we don't know that if there's anything wrong in this way and uh, we will continue to improve it but uh, we do come up with a lot of excited crashes on the pillow okay so uh, let's look at some crashes uh, so while fuzzing the first thing we did was uh, set up OSS locally and just try to run it like the run it run the fuzzer with the default seed and the default harness but surprisingly uh, for us we found that after fuzzing for less than an hour we found a crash and we were really surprised to found, find that but uh, so the next step was to see if it is really a crash and try to reproduce it next slide so we compiled the fuzzer with address sanitizer and uh, checked the backtrace of the crash. So we, we found that the crash occurs in a function called expand row inside a SGI decode function. And uh, so we, we tried to debug and analyze the source code. Uh, next slide. So while looking at the source code, uh, we saw that the uh, inside the SGI decode function, there's a field called RLE offset, which uh, which is actually uh, which which is actually retrieved from the image, and it is calculated by subtracting a SGI header field. So sometimes when the RLE offset field is like really small or zero, uh, it can be negative if SGI header is bigger than that. And this uh, one, if it is negative and it is used inside this array as an index, uh, there is a possibility that it, it is actually ac accessing some random memory address, and which is in turn used inside the expand row function where the heap buffer overflow actually happens. So once we confirm the bug, uh, the next thing we did was uh, report it. Next. But unfortunately, when we reported it, we found that uh, they had they were all, already aware of the bug, and it was a fix was already planned. So, 
uh, it was unfortunate for us, but we continued frozing pillow and we found many more crashes. Uh, in total, we, we got around 10 crashes and most of them were inside uh, the image decode functions, like pillow supports, like multiple image formats. And as we had already, like uh, we were already fuzzing the different image formats by dividing the seeds. Uh, we we found five unique heap of bugs and a DOS bug which uh, which was affecting like multiple image formats. And uh, yeah, as you can see from the image, like uh, okay, so uh, let's look at some example bugs. Uh, I can go to the previous slide. Yeah. So as you can see from the image, uh, this is actually the same bug as we discussed earlier. And as you can see from the left side of the image, uh, it is before the bug was actually patched. So this RLA offset field uh, was updated incorrectly and it was used inside expand row. And on the right side, you can see that uh, the in the past, the maintainers added a check to see if RLA offset is less than uh, header size so that it doesn't underflow the field array. Yeah, next slide. And the other type of bug which we found was a denial of service bug, which in which the image size was not checked properly and which which in turn caused uh, the code to allocate like huge, really huge amounts of memory. And this was also passed by the maintainers. And they just added a check for the image size, which if it is like really large, it just, uh, the, it, it just pops out an error. Next slide. So in total, we submitted three bug reports uh, about uh, three, five different bugs, and we were assigned three CVs. And all, all the three CVs which we were assigned were for the memory denial of service bug uh, inside the different file formats like BLP, ICNS, and ICO. Yeah. Um, so just to conclude what we learned from the course and after fuzzing like multiple programs, uh, we learned that uh, target selection is like really critical and we got lucky. Uh, we, we used existing tools, existing frameworks to fuzz programs which were like already being fuzzed. Uh, what, we, what we really did was just like make small tweaks uh, like the, like writing better harnesses, trying new seats and like dividing seats according to image formats and fuzzing it on like multiple cores. And we learned that uh, although like there are existing tools, uh, like there are ex the, there are tools which are already existing, but some of them are like quite new and Atheris is new and uh, fuzzing pillow with Atheris is quite new. So we, we got lucky there as well. And uh, we found that most of the time, uh, the programs which were which are being first by other researchers and uh, OSS was is uh, written in C plus C or C plus plus, so it might be a good idea to explore fuzzing different programs written in different languages and just like trying out different combinations to see if you can find bugs. And another important thing which we learned was triaging bugs can take time, and if you like if 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 you take up so much time, you can get scooped which is what ha happened with uh, like one of the bug reports which we reported. Okay, thank you, that's it. All right, thank you Team Syntax. Um, so for those of you not um, religiously refreshing Twitter, I've been trying to live uh, tweet the uh, class. So hopefully um, I captured a good good discussion of, um, of Team Syntax's uh, presentation um yeah so team syntax uh, is just one of the five teams and they already had you know awesome um impact in pillow real code used by real people even used by shellfish um so that was uh super super cool to see um let's see uh let me ch catch up on the twitch chat uh all right which is going good. So who wants to uh, go next? Um, we had uh, Team Conclusion wanted to go earlier rather than later, right? Uh, I think 
we we kind of agreed on on Discord that it would be uh, Team Transmitter and then okay. Team Conclusion. Sounds good. Let's go live with Team Transmitter. All right. So let me share my screen. Okay, so everything, you can see the presentation, just making sure. Yeah. All right, awesome. All Take right. Away. Okay. Hello, hackers. We are Team Transmitter, and today we'll be giving a brief overview on what we learned through the CSC 598 Applied Vulnerability Research course. Um, I'm Sean Smits, and the rest of the team, as you can see, is on the slide. Um, so let's get into target selection. In the initial first few weeks of the course, we had to individually brainstorm and pick targets to look into for vulnerabilities. Uh, as you can see, this is our compiled teams list. After further analysis of each target, we quickly narrowed it down to Kimu, Respondus Lockdown Browser, and Pigs. Kimu was an appealing target as it's a fairly popular em emulator and would likely involve a more creative and custom exploit. One technique we considered was diverting control flow of a service inside of a Kimu instance, as opposed to running this service natively. The direction we thought of for this would be running thousands of programs inside Kimu, as well as natively and compare to find control flow differences. Our Respondus Lockdown Browser was another target we considered, as Respondus is responsible for creating a controlled online testing environment for universities across the nation. It seemed a fitting target for educational purposes, of course. That being said, we did take into consideration the implication of trying to exploit such a service as it could be viewed in a negative light. Um, since most of our team had little experience with this software, we had a lot of questions to begin with, such as, is this program built on top of a pre-existing browser or is it written from scratch? And does it use standard JS engine or could we fuzz the engine itself to achieve remote code execution? Before delving deeper into the details, we explored our other option, PIGS. And PIGS was a realistic target for us for many reasons. Uh, firstly, it didn't involve, it didn't appear to be an extremely popular GitHub project that was being fuzzed, but still held relevance with 1.3 cases and was found as a dependency in several other projects. Secondly, it seemed like a target that would cater to traditional fuzzing and reversing techniques, which would allow us to get real world practice in these areas. And lastly, the code base was relatively small and there was only one individual maintaining the project. This gave us the impression that we could efficiently go through most of the code and four minds could find the faults of one much faster. Um, because of these reasons, we decided to set our target as pigs. Now, what is PIGS? PIGS, or PIGZ, is a parallel, com parallel imp implementation of GZIP that, as creator Mark Adler puts it, exploits multiple processors and multiple cores to the hilt when compressing data. Unbeknownst to us at the time, Mark Adler is a fairly well-known software engineer, primarily for his work in data compression. He actually created his own Adler32 checksum function was a co-author of the Zlib compression library and gzip itself. As previously mentioned, PigZ is used in several large projects such as Mobi, CyanogenMod, and certain Linux distros, as well as some other smaller projects using it primarily for decompression. Yeah, so uh, we decided as a first step to analyzing pigs that we would start with fuzzing it. So there's kind of a number of options in beginning our analysis. Um, fuzzing is more or less the most straightforward first option rather than going through and reverse engineering and understanding exactly how pigs works. Um, just throw a fuzzer at it and let the fuzzer figure out how it works. So that was kind of our first step. Um, so in doing this, we had actually a number of directions to go. Um, we ultimately settled on setting up AFL++ and then basically setting up everything that AFL++ says is cool alongside of that. So there are a number of things that AFL++ describes in its documentation for um, enhancing your fuzzing campaign. And we'll kind of look a little bit into some of those. 
So the first one that AFL++ talks about is this LTO mode. Um, so basically there's a common problem in fuzzing where you have this relatively small uh, bitmap that tracks the coverage of the program. And it's pretty easy for this bitmap to have hash collisions in uh, tracking that coverage. So um, at just 256 instrumented blocks, which is, would be a very small program already, um, you're on average already going to have one collision. And these collisions are going to mess with your ability to um, track the coverage properly. Um, so one of the things that AFL++ introduced was this link time optimization mode, um, which was a thing, or one of the things they took advantage of from Clang is a link time optimization mode, which allows them to do uh, various things at link time. Um, and basically they use this as a way of um, effectively guaranteeing non-colliding edge coverage. So they go through and analyze all of these edges and um, basically make it so that the identifiers for those edges um, are guaranteed non-colliding. So this has a 10 to 25% speed gain compared to LLVM mode. Um, the downside, I guess, being that the compile time um, for binaries is a bit longer, um, but this wasn't much of an issue for us. Um, so yeah, this was the first kind of thing that we explored from the AFL++ documentation that seemed uh, to be pretty cool. Um, so the next thing and possibly the coolest thing that we, uh, we learned about um, was sanitizers. So for those of you unfamiliar with sanitizers, um, sanitizers can do a number of things. I think uh, if you've taken punk or work worked your way through some of Pwn College, you're probably familiar with stack canaries, where stack canaries uh, have like a small little buffer. Um, if the memory in that buffer gets modified, the program at runtime detects that modification and aborts. Um, so sanitizers can work in a very similar way for all sorts of different purposes. So in this example, you can see for detecting buffer overflows, basically the compiler goes through and instruments all of these buffers putting um, essentially these canary-like things in between all of your local variables and is able to detect if one of them is overwritten and similarly will abort and tell you about this. Um, there's all sorts of other compile time instrumentation that can be used for detecting other issues, but um, that's kind of the, the basic gist of it that we, we learned about. And basically compiling your program when you're gonna go and fuzz, um, if you don't have sanitizers enabled, basically you're only going to uh, detect crashes, whereas this will allow us to detect a buffer overflow that doesn't involve a crash, which is really nice. Um, okay, so, and then if you've ever looked at kind of a bug report that involves memory corruption, you've probably seen this thing on the right, uh, which is basically just a big stack trace and uh, ASAN talking about what's going on in the crash. Uh, so that's kind of uh, for reference if you've seen this sort of report. Okay. So the next thing that AFL++ talked about was a thing called CompCov, and it's also known as LAF Intel. Um, so it's kind of straightforward. Basically, while you're going through and compiling the program, it splits comparisons apart. Um, so you could imagine this example here where you have some string compare trying to see if some part of your input is crash. Uh, at compile time, it will split this comparison of crash into a series of comparisons. And the reason it does this is that it's a lot easier to fuzz through this. So on the left, we have this basically, if you imagine the fuzzer just randomly generating stuff, you have this 200, 256 to the six possibility of finding crash randomly. Or is by splitting it apart, as soon as it finds the C, it's gonna mark that input as interesting because it'll have increased coverage now that you've kind of gone to a new basic block. Um, and you can basically just, enumerate all your way through this comparison. So rather than being 256 to the six, now it's 256 times six, which makes from like a probabilistic perspective, uh, the fuzzer much happier in terms of exploring this comparison. Okay, and then another thing that um, AFL++ talks about. So AFL++ really documents a lot of kind of state of the art um, things with fuzzing. I highly recommend anyone that is interested in doing some fuzzing, look into and read all of their documentation. It's really useful. Um, so the next thing is Complog, also more commonly known as Red Queen. Um, so it does a similar-ish thing to the prior uh, CompCov, but instead it does this um, 
at runtime, basically. It, it, it can detect these um, comparisons. It takes that compared value and sends it off to the mutator to um, allow the mutator basically to use this value. So now <clears throat> once it's detected that this is part of a comparison, the mutator is now aware of this and is much more likely to just kind of shoot that into an input. Okay. And then the final one, and this one uh, I'm much less clear about, but AFL++ documented it. And we figured, you know, we'll just do everything that AFL++ says is cool, is this thing called mopt. So according to the description of mopt, it utilizes a customized particle swarm optimization PSO algorithm to find the optimal selection probability distribution of operators with respect to fuzzing effectiveness. Um, so I looked a little bit into this further because this really from the onset doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, it seems like basically you have all of these different mutation operations and whether it's like uh, changing the value to some predefined integer or I don't know, there's all sorts of mutation operations and basically it tries to figure out um, rather than just randomly picking them, doing a more efficient picking of them, I think. I'm not exactly sure, but it didn't really matter for us because AFL++ talked about it. And so we figured we'd just include it. Okay. Um, so after setting up the fuzzer with all the optimizations and techniques that Connor talked about before, uh, we decided to use static analysis techniques. Um, specifically, we used uh, AFL code to find out the coverage of the source code by the AFL generated inputs. Um, we discovered that the coverage was only 26.2% of the source code uh, spread across 50% of the total functions. Um, even though coverage percentage was really low, but we discovered we were covering almost all of the uncompression part of the code, which we were fuzzing. Majority of code was for compression algorithm since that was the functionality in which uh, multi-threading was implemented. Uh, we also thought about adding new seeds in the input at this point, but figured it would not make a huge impact on coverage. Um, we tried to understand the code and find the vulnerabilities using disassemblers, uh, specifically binary ninja and some plugins like one fanatic, but uh, it gave us false positives. Um, several weeks uh, run into running the fuzzer, we had 53.6 billion executions, but unfortunately zero crashes. Um, some of the reasons we could give for this would be uh, the code size was relatively small, approximately uh, about 6,000 lines of C code. Um, the input to the program was not too complicated, thus we could not generate very complex inputs. Um, the program could have been first heavily since it, it was widely used in projects like Docker and then also shipped default with some Linux distributions. And last but not the least, um, we hugely underestimated Mark Adler. He, he, he turned out to be too powerful. So with our failure documented pretty well, we decided to go back to the drawing board. <clears throat> and so we considered some of the old targets that we had previously talked about. And then we also considered some new targets. And so essentially like really the only target of note, two targets of note on this list that we really kind of dove into was um, the BPF portion of the Linux kernel, because ideally like vul any vulnerabilities that are found here are extremely high value, even though it is a fairly looked at target and it was just something that we all found very exciting. However, the essentially the reason we decided to focus our attention to mu PDF was because we all know that PDF software is notoriously insecure, like notably like Adobe PDF has like a insane amount of CVEs associated with it. And when we discovered that mu PDF had a JavaScript interpreter associated with it, usually attaching for like embedding JS forms and like other use cases, we decided to just shift our attention to MuJS since there's a lot of like high profile JavaScript engines, for example, like Chrome's V8 and um, a couple others. And so we were like, well, maybe since MuJS isn't as popular, it's not going to be as well fuzz as other JavaScript engines. This did turn out to be true. And so we can talk about setting up a fuzzer for that. 
So just a little bit of background before I dive straight into the fuzzer is Mujs is a lightweight and portable JavaScript interpreter. It's basically designed for simplicity. It's portable. And essentially the goal is to be able to take it and embed it into larger projects whenever you need this functionality. And it's maintained by Artifact Software. So in order to set up our fuzzer, which was the first thing that we decided to do, just because like that was the familiar direction, is we looked at a number of different fuzzers that were designed for fuzzing JavaScript, and we ultimately settled on Fuzili. And the reason that we settled on Fuzili is because traditional fuzzing methods are highly ineffective against like interpreters just due to like strict syntax validity requirements. And our group decided that Fuzili was just the way to go because it's a coverage guided grammar based fuzzer written in Swift. And it is specifically designed to fuzz JavaScript. And so the basic idea here, it's on screen for your viewing pleasure, is Fuzili formulates JavaScript as a context free grammar, applies production rules to it, and then reduces it to get you reduced JavaScript code that is considered a corpus. And the team behind Fuzili accomplishes this by basically creating an intermediary language that they call Fuzzial. And it captures control and data flow. And then it uses defined mutations on this intermediary in intermediate language to mutate it for fuzzing purposes. So mutation, for example, could be um, mutating function inputs by passing in newer different or existing arguments, calling new functions or inserting new and existing code at random points. And changes to this intermediate, intermediate language would result in large changes to the output of JavaScript code. And so in order to set up this fuzzer, which by the way, this is well documented on their GitHub page. Like I'm just gonna give you a really brief overview. Basically you have to implement Fuzili's REPRL protocol, which is a read, evaluate, print, reset loop. And the reason they do this is because they, we want to have one process run many test cases and then reset itself between each one. And so this is done to reduce overhead when starting new instances of the JavaScript engine. And it ultimately just speeds up the fuzzer a ton. And this is really easy. Like you can literally go in and look at the targets that they already have defined. And it's really as simple as just adapting what already exists to your new code. You can just leverage it. It's really easy. And then you add crash tests into the JavaScript engine to ensure Fuzili can catch crashes. You add a coverage system that they have defined literally just by including a file and pasting a function into the main. And then you add a profile to Fuzili to determine basically like your fuzzing settings essentially. So like this is where a lot of the thinking comes into play because you can mess with things such as process arguments, environment variables, and then built-ins that you wish to target. So for example, if you have a function that triggers garbage collection, obviously that's something that you want to look at. And so you can set it up in the fuzzer to say, hey, make sure we focus on this function because we think there's bugs here. And what we also did was we added sanitizers into this. We tried to add a lot of different sanitizers, but we found that really beyond a ASAN and UBSAN, there was really not a lot of flexibility here, but just including those was enough to get some really cool bugs pumping out. And then finally, you just sprinkle some computing resources on it and hopefully watch bugs fall out. And so Connor's gonna talk about what we've found. Yeah, so unlike Mu or unlike uh, pigs, we did actually find bugs in Mu.js. So the first, we found a number of them. So the first one we found was a null pointer dereference. Um, so you can see at the bottom kind of a proof of concept for it. Um, the code was basically expecting that length would be zero or positive, but in fact, JavaScript is insane and you can basically just specify the length of arbitrary objects. Um, so we could directly say, hey, length is negative one. And then as soon as this wasn't true, basically, um, you can't exactly see the code here, but it, the code would continue on rather than return out and ultimately resulted in a null pointer dereference. So that was uh, pretty exciting, finally getting a bug uh, probably around halfway into this course after spending so much time uh, with pigs and switching targets and actually finding a bug was pretty awesome. Um, so then we found a, another bug. Um, this one we found very quickly. So we were monitoring Mu.js, basically seeing, hey, they pushed out a new commit. Um, let's update our fuzzer to now be fuzzing on this latest version. And uh, as soon as we did that on one of the occasions, um, within like 20 seconds of the fuzzer running, probably not even, um, immediately the sanitizers started spitting out uh, basically crashes. Um, 
So in this case, they had just introduced some JavaScript string to long um, function and it was implemented incorrectly. So basically you can see the patch here. Um, it's basically going through each character in a string, subtracting the ASCII zero from it um, in order to basically convert it to an integer and checking to see if that's less than 10. So basically the idea being that eventually um, your input might have like an A or something and that is going to be greater. Um, and so then we'll finally exit out of this loop. Um, but this logic is wrong because it doesn't take the, the smaller side of things. So for instance, a null byte is going to be one subtracted from uh, ASCII zero is going to be less than 10. Um, I mean, it'll be a negative number, but it'll still be less than 10. Um, so this functionality basically is wrong and the fuzzer instantly caught this, um, which was pretty cool. Um, we also found another bug in this same function that was basically due to the fact that they were treating all of these characters as uh, integers rather than unsigned characters. So because they were treating them as integers, um, when we accessed into that string as we're walking along, if the value was greater than hex 80, so basically uh, it could theoretically be considered negative, um, we would negatively index into a table that was used for um, converting string to long in the case where the base wasn't 10 and they used basically a table lookup to figure out what the value should be interpreted as. Um, so yeah, you could negatively <clears throat> index into this table basically doing an out of bounds negative access. Um, so the fuzzer also very quickly picked this up. Um, so those were the first three bugs that we found. There weren't really um, major security stories. Um, I guess in theory, that first one we could have used to crash the program, whereas the second two wouldn't crash the program. Um, so that first one being able to crash the program theoretically could be a denial of service, um, but not super interesting security stories for these first three. Um, but then after a long period of no bugs showing up, uh, eventually we got our fourth bug. And this one actually had security implications. So we found a heap use after free, or I guess the fuzzer found a heap use after free, and we uh, enjoyed the reward of that. Um, where basically um, there was use after free in JavaScript regex objects. So this was uh, patched. Um, here's a proof of concept of that use after free. So you can see here, we define this leak heap function. So basically we define a regex, um, which basically is going to malloc space for this regex object. Um, and then we would grab the source of that regex object, basically just grab a reference to it. Um, JavaScript is insane. So I guess you can increment a regex object, which ultimately dropped the reference to that regex object. Um, so now we're sitting here with a reference to um, source and then this garbage collected language as soon as, if it's, I guess we'll see here in a second. So we basically then go on and trigger garbage collection by just creating a bunch of objects and freeing them. Um, and this, as this triggers the garbage collection, it ultimately turns out that when it goes to garbage collect this regex object, it also garbage collected the source part of that, um, which is no good because we still have a reference to that source uh, thing. So now we have a use after free. So in the case of this uh, proof of concept that we set up, we um, were able to basically leak heap pointers, um, which you can see kind of here at the bottom, us running this proof of exploit and kind of doing this crazy Python to convert it from crazy bytes into an actual uh, hex value. You can see basically we're getting um, a heap pointer. So finally we found a security relevant bug and that's pretty awesome. And now we have a CVE pending for that. Okay. And then finally, uh, those, so those are the four bugs we found that hey, we sorry to figured, you. Yeah, 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 there's a question, go for it. Um, can you talk about the applicability of that bug unless I missed it? Yeah, so if we go back here. Um, so we tried messing around with getting more um, useful primitives after, out of this use after free. So in this case, we have this proof of concept that is able to do a uh, memory disclosure of 
a heap address. So basically now we know where the heap is and um, I guess the, the super simple answer is I highly recommend doing Pwn College and learning about why a heap disclosure is awesome. Um, but I guess the longer answer is that a lot of exploits um, kind of require two stages where the first stage is to disclose um, some memory and then the rest of your exploits going to do some memory corruption based off that disclosed thing. Um, so for instance, in this case, we're leaking heap addresses, but you could imagine the case where you're leaking um, addresses in the binary. Um, so basically where code is located. And if you wanted to overwrite some saved instruction pointer and point it to jump to incorrect code, but code inside of the binary, you have to know where that code is. And so the first step is to get a memory disclosure. Um, you can use that same idea for getting keep addresses is also very useful. Um, so yeah, uh, so this is going to give us a heap address disclosure, um, which is useful in secu uh, for security reasons. Um, and again, to do Pwn College if uh, you're a little unsure on what that means. What about applicability um, in terms of like um, versions of MuJS? Oh yeah, so it was actually really interesting. That's a good point, I forgot to mention that. Um, this bug is actually present in every single version of MuJS, um, which is actually pretty surprising because we've read some stuff about people fuzzing MuJS. Um, so it's interesting that this bug has been around for like four years or so. Um, so anyways, we also tried to convert this into some sort of remote code execution. Um, we were unsuccessful because even though it's a use after free, we aren't actually able to modify this, the contents of source at all, which is kind of the dream, basically being able to, if you modify this source, then whatever object is also going to be allocated at that same spot. Basically, you're able to modify it without it expecting it being modified. Um, but since it's a string object, and in JavaScript, strings are basically immutable, there's no way for us to write JavaScript that then goes on and starts modifying the contents of this source object. Um, so without the ability to actually modify, or we were thinking about some ways potentially that we could get modifications, um, but ultimately we've decided to just submit the bug and kind of move on with our lives um, after we got this heap disclosure. Um, yeah, we couldn't exactly figure out how to get a remote code execution, but it's potentially still possible, but probably pretty unlikely. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the security story of that. Does that answer your questions, Jan, or is there anything else you want me to talk Absolutely. about? Absolutely. Awesome. Okay, so then the final thing after we found our four bugs is that we decided to contribute our fuzzing setup to MuJS. So it's pretty clear that um, MuJS might be slightly lacking in some ways in terms of like continuous integration um, or basically kind of automatic, awesome, helpful ways of being able to analyze their project. And we kind of have evidence of this based off of them pushing a commit and then a fuzzer being able to detect bugs in that within like 10 seconds. Um, that there's some lacking things that they could basically benefit from having a fuzzer. Um, so we got this all bundled up and pushed as a, or we made a pull request against MuJS seeing if uh, they're interested in this at all. Um, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at with that. Okay. Yeah, so over the course of the semester, there was a lot our team learned. Um, our first lesson, as many in the field of CS already know, reading the docs is crucial for practically everything. Um, whether it was setting up AFL++ or Fuzili, reconfiguring Docker files, adding sanitizers to the fuzzer, or even troubleshooting errors, we found solutions through actually reading the written manuals or reading a more in-depth post regarding the manuals. Um, it seems very straightforward, but it can often save a lot of time uh, to simply read everything compared to self-investigation. Um, another thing we learned is it can be difficult to set up a good fuzzing harness, especially, especially since one of the main ways to determine if your harness is effective is through actually running it for a significant amount of time. Um, one thing our team did notice, however, is the default setup of many fuzzing tools is surprisingly effective. 
In our case, we were able to find bugs with Fusili right out of the box. We did, of course, add sanitizers, but we didn't manipulate the fuzzer to cater to our specific target in any way. Uh, this is interesting since others in the past have fuzzed MuJS and heavily fuzzed MuPDF, but the use after free vulnerability was never found, but we were able to catch this using a fresh Fusili setup. Um, also in our experience, we concluded that sanitizers are major poggers. Of the bugs we found, half of them were thanks to address sanitization. This is a relatively simple feature to add to your fuzzer and it can go a long way. Um, fortunately, we were also forced to realize that some targets are simply not vulnerable enough. The small code base and one man developing team of pigs seem attractive to us as poners at the time but we've since concluded this actually helped Mark Adler and his project security. The 6,000 lines of C, of which only half we focused on for our realistic security story, narrowed our chances of finding any bugs. Moreover, since Mark Adler was the only developer, there's a smaller likelihood of bugs in the code as he wrote every line himself, which avoids any conflict of multiple developers writing code. And on top of this, Pigs takes in a simplistic input, making it difficult to manipulate our um, input drastically. And then although we were unable to obliterate pigs, we learned that it's okay to pivot and focus on a new project. Had we become emotionally attached to the idea of beating Mark Adler, there would have been no PRs submitted, no fuzzer contribution, and no potential CVE for our work on MuJS. So thank you. Awesome. Awesome. All Any right. questions in general or? Yeah, let's let's um, pause uh, to get some questions on the Twitch. Thank you, Team Transmitter. That was super awesome. Um, someone on Twitch is asking, let's see POC. I don't know if you want to run the POC live, but uh, it's uh, the POC was, was in that. I guess it'll be a very similar thing to, the, to what was in the slides already. Um, cool. All right. Um, let's uh, roll onwards. Uh, who is next? Great job, Team Transmitter. So for those of us sorry, that joined partway through um, Team Transmitter's uh, presentation, uh, we're going through every team um, and uh, seeing what their outcome of the class was, what their experience was, and um, so on. Um, I'm also live tweeting this. I'm trying to keep up um, madly and, and keep things interesting. Um, so it should be cool. All right, take it away, team conclusion. All right, uh, thanks, Jan. So we are team conclusion, uh, Aaron, Bailey, Daniel, and myself, and we're gonna present what happened to us during this semester. And as a hint uh, that I'm going to give you, there is a bit of a spoiler in the title. <laughs> so the first step was about picking a target to attack. And um, after a bit, we kind of decided to go after uh, Radar 2, which is a set of tools for reverse engineering that is completely open source, um, pretty well documented with an active community. So it fits the different uh, criteriums that Jan wanted for a target. And another very interesting thing, it is uh, written in C. So very potentially prone to um, memory errors and memory corruptions. And another other interesting thing was it had been first before. So we were able to uh, take inspiration from the work of people uh, before us to get started a bit faster. We identified three kind of uh, attacks that we were willing to, to land on radar. And uh, the first one was to try to exploit people using it by uh, giving them uh, malicious binary files that an attacker could have crafted just to try to exploit them uh, and execute arbitrary code on their machines. But uh, if that wasn't possible, we um, would have been quite happy to be able to exploit uh, debugging uh, sessions where several people can share the share an instance of radar to debug a single binary, but then a victim can share its session with an attacker that then has access to 
not only the binary that is debugged, but to the command that are uh, given to Red Array as well. Uh, and at last, if none of the uh, two first are where possible, we can at least try to craft binaries that are impossible to reverse using Red Array because it would make it crash. So now we got a target, but we need some bugs to exploit, right? We need some way to get uh, binaries that make Red Array crash or do something interesting. We considered doing some static analysis, but our group was relatively new to vulnerability research and Red Array's got a massive code base. So we figured, eh, let's just fuzz it. So this was actually pretty straightforward for our project. Uh, it was pretty easy to compile Red Array with some instrumentation. Uh, we used AFL for our uh, fuzzing because it was pretty straightforward. And honestly, it was pretty easy to get fuzzing just running. We threw in an input corpus of a sample of some ELF files, a few with dwarf debugging headers, and we ran it with a few command line options. So it run some initial commands on startup to mimic some analysis of the binary, like OBA0, IA, and AA. And just with a simple setup, we were able to get crashes with AFL pretty quickly. Uh, this continued through the whole project, actually. And we really didn't have any uh, I mean, we weren't lacking for crashes, essentially is what we're saying, but uh, exploits, well, we'll talk about that later. Uh, because this works so well, uh, it means there are actually a lot of things we tried and didn't do, or a lot of things we just didn't consider. For example, libfuzzer. Uh, one would think, well, router is built in C, we got the source code, why don't we use libfuzzer? Well, we tried. We set up a harness initially uh, and got it almost working, but it leaked a lot of memory, either due to our harness setup or maybe a memory leak in Red R, and it wasn't really working. Uh, so we abandoned it for the time being. We did later set up with some two-dimensional fuzzing, which we'll talk about later, but think of it like fuzzing the inputs at the same time as the binary itself. Another thing we tried, sanitizers. Those are pretty helpful. Those caught some memory errors, but we didn't use it in our fuzzing setup because it was slow. Uh, our fuzzing of Red R2 was pretty slow already, and adding sanitizers pretty much cut the efficiency in half, which uh, wasn't great. And since we were able to find bugs pretty easily without sanitizers enabled, we ignored them for most of the project. Uh, finally, code coverage. Well, it was something we considered, something that was built in, and we were able to get some code coverage. But it wasn't really a focus for the project because uh, we were able to get new crashes just by throwing in a new input corpus, a few new command line options. So worrying about code coverage wasn't a huge concern for us. So we got fuzzing set up with AFL. It's working pretty well, but there's one problem. It's slow, really slow in fact, only getting about 60 or so executions a second, which for AFL is not especially great. We need to scale up. So luckily for us, ASU let us use a Kubernetes cluster. And what we did was we created a bunch of Docker pods of AFL fuzzing Red R, created 64 of them and let them run in parallel on the cluster. But we didn't want this setup to be, we'll say a dumb setup. We wanted some way to keep track of crashes, try to minimize them and whatnot. So we created a more complex infrastructure to keep track of stuff, which uh, Bailey will talk about. Sure, yeah. So to add to that, um, something that we're really proud of that we were able to design was a fuzzing architecture that utilized a um, shared NFS cluster uh, that we called the sync directory. So the way it worked, we would have each of the AFL pods working uh, on their own cluster, just chugging along and finding crashes. And then periodically, every 30 minutes or, or hours, customizable, um, the pods would push all of their most recent finds from their corpus, from their corpi, to the sync directory. And then the, uh, a libfuzzer minimizer is constantly running and pulling in from all of the directories in that sync directory. And it's, and it's going to minimize it to produce a new master queue for the um, pool of all of the AFL pods. And at the same time, we also had an AFL coverage uh, coverager running that would constantly run coverage um, analysis on that master queue. Now, while we had it running, we didn't really have a lot of time to actually check what it produced, but it was there in case we did uh, end up want to check it. And then later on in the semester, we also spooled up a good few libfuzzer pods, but due to time constraints, we weren't able to hook them up um, to the AFL system of the, of the syncing with NFS. Um, so they worked as completely isolated as they worked. So unless... Uh... So many other teams, we were blessed with uh, hundreds of crashes. And thanks to the scaling of the infrastructure we had, we were able to really 
um, get all the infrastructure rolling and cruising and, and, and get crashes coming our way um, in, a, in, in a very nice kind of setup. Um, but the problem was we didn't really want crashes. We were looking to exploit uh, them and to try to find like, meaningful bugs from the security perspective. So we needed to analyze and triage all these crashes. So the first step when triaging is actually group crashes that are due to the same underlying bug. Uh, this is something that is called uh, bucketization. So we took a very naive approach uh, to that problem at the beginning, where we would take the crashes one by one, um, run them into GDB and try to find out why and locate why it is crashes and locate precisely where the bug was coming from. And once we would locate the bug, we would make up a really um, dirty patch. And you'll see how dirty uh, in one of the subsequent slides. And once we had this patch, we'd be able to recompile our target. So we would recompile radar and then rerun the crashes against it. And now, uh, hopefully, many, many files that were crashing before aren't crashing anymore. So that would allow us to um, remove all the crashes that are not failing anymore because we can deduce that they were due to the same underlying bug that we just discovered. The problem with that approach is that we had crashes coming much faster than we were able to treat them. And um, another problem of that is we don't know before analyzing the bug if it will be um, interesting for, from an exploitation point of view, or if it will be just a meaningless, um, like easy to fix bug that doesn't have any security implication. So for that, we turn to Crashwalk, which is a, a tool that will that allowed us to automatically triage all the bugs we had, all the crashes we had, um, and help us to prioritize the bugging because crack, Crashwalk will tell us the kind of bugs uh, that the crash was um, manifesting and, and allow us to dedicate our time to things that were like potentially very juicy. Uh, sadly, as we learned going through crash work reports and uh, debugging the crashes that it was raising, uh, we learned that crash work still had a lot of false positive and were and was judging crashes as being like, uh, critically critical and highly with high chances of being exploitable. Uh, where in fact, not really. And yeah, we got disappointed. Okay, <clears throat> so here's a brief history of the semester or more specifically a brief history of our fuzzing attempts. So we initially started by fuzzing with the commands OBA, IA and AA. And this led to many crashes, but sadly none were exploitable. Then we modified the fuzzing to run without the OBA command. This led to even more crashes, but still none were exploitable. However, we realized that many of the crashes the fuzzers were detecting were actually based on the parse dwarf sections in radar. So for our next iteration of fuzzing, we created an entirely new corpus that was full of elves that did not even have debugging information to begin with. This meant that the fuzzers could not discover and hang on these same dwarf errors, but mutate on some new stuff. We also switched to something called 2D fuzzing. Basically what this meant was that AFL will mutate along two different axes, one being the binary itself and the second being the commands that it runs. Lastly, Radar, too, um, Radar also had many features that would require user input and that would cause issues while fuzzing. According to Jamie Zawinski's famous law, every program attempts to expand until it can read mail. Those programs which cannot expand are replaced by those who can. And Radar has a lot of features beyond the disassembler. It has full Vim support, a browser chat functionality, and all of these require user input. Lastly, there's also a nice Easter egg in there where while fuzzing when we attempted to send a certain number of A's, it claimed to send a, a developer of Radar directly to our home. Again, this waited for user input. So to avoid these user input hangs, we required a timeout in our harness and this let us fuzz a lot more smoother. All right, so as for bugs, we, um, in like analyzing the bugs that were coming up, we noticed a good amount of them were errors, um, were memory errors on startup. Now, a lot of these ended up churning out to uh, result from the fact that we didn't fully understand that original 
fuzzing skeleton we had borrowed uh, in that it was using OBA0 and IA. Uh, it was allocating memory for the program explicitly and then also implicitly by, um, by calling radar A2 with the file being passed in. So that resulted in a lot of the heap errors and uh, memory exploitations being uh, things that wouldn't quite appear in a real session. So it's not really uh, relevant to our, to, to our uh, search. And also a lot of them happened atomically without any user input in between. So it wasn't something that we could exploit and like get in there in the middle between the free and the uh, use after free. Another big thing, uh, we had a lot of dwarf errors because Radar YouTube doesn't like to work with malformed dwarfs. Uh, and something that is interesting is that uh, it's not the only one, but we'll get to that soon. Um, and then we also get a lot of suspicious errors like uh, infinite looping exhausting stack. Now, while this could have maybe been fruitful, we weren't able to find a way to exploit it and just ended up using a dirty patch to get past it. And then lastly, uh, we had a few double free errors that with more time and experience in uh, static analysis, we may have been able to exploit, but nothing came of it in the time that we uh, went at them. So here are some numbers um, that we got after fuzzing for the semester. Uh, so as it was um, laid out before, we had four different steps uh, in all during the semester. So the first one was like this original setup with the extra uh, OBA0 passed to Radar that proved to be a mistake. Um, the fuzzer ran for about like 25 days. It found about like 500 something crashes. The interesting thing was like, despite the, the fuzzer command being wrong for from the security uh, story that we wanted to exploit, we still ended up having uh, crashes that led to bug that were actually like maybe security sensitive and were able to report them uh, as genuine bugs that were present in Red Area. Um, the second step was to make it proper and remove this uh, superfluous command that we're passing. And then again, the time uh, the fuzzer run for was about 25 days, but this time the number of crashes simply skyrocketed. Um, the, one of the reason for that, for that was this uh, fuzzing uh, session was using the previous fuzzing sessions output uh, that was like all the crashes that were the 500 something crashes that were generated originally were still valid input for AFL to try to find more crashes during the second session. And that's why we ended up with such a high number of crashes uh, later on. Then, uh, because we were annoyed in debugging uh, the dwarf passing mechanism of radar, we decided to restart from zero with a Corpi, a corpus completely clean of uh, dwarf information. So we only had um, binaries without debugging information. And then we started running the fuzzing and the fuzzing infrastructure again. And it ran for about seven days and we found about 90 crashes. And then we spent a bit of time um, setting up the libfuzzer harness to do this uh, 2D fuzzing idea, like fuzzing both the binary and the commands at the same time. But sadly, at this time, the cluster was not available anymore, and we never were able to um, get any runtime and, and then crashes out of it. Um, as for exploitation, while we weren't able to find any uh, find or exploit any exploits uh, during the class time, uh, had we had more knowledge of how the dwarf section works or how to substitute a malformed dwarf with a good dwarf, uh, it would have been easy to just do that for a uh, given like a piece of malware, just sub out a, uh, the bytes that we know would crash radar A2 and then that would be an attack scenario. And something else of note that we found interesting was that in attempting to understand more, of, more about the dwarf, we had passed a uh, binary that was crashing radar A2 into the LLVM parser and noticed that it, it would also cause that parser to choke. So it would have been interesting with more time to have moved laterally and fuzzed the LLVM parser to see if we could uh, keep exploring that, um, that train of thought and seeing if something would have popped up there. 
Okay, so maybe we weren't able to find any super cool exploits aside from maybe some denial of service stuff, but we were still able to find some bugs of varying interest. Uh, here's an example of one of the bugs we found that we later submitted and was uh, patched in router two. It's pretty straightforward. We pass in a 21 kilobyte binary. Uh, most of the details aren't important, but the dwarf section is completely garbled and doesn't make any sense whatsoever. router two tries to parse it and the line at the bottom, the sturdoop uh, string.content is an invalid memory address and router crashes. Okay, all well and good. Uh, relatively straightforward bug. Uh, while debugging, uh, we had to make a dirty patch to try to patch this so we could you know, ignore these class crashes of the same class. And so what's uh, boxed in red is our attempt to fix it. Uh, not a clean fix if you look at it. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a messy way to test if our memory address is out of the valid space, but it worked well enough for our purposes. Uh, so if we move on to the next slide, uh, here's actually what was fixed when we submitted and uh, Pancake kindly uh, actually fixed Radar 2. A bit more elegant, as it turns out. Uh, this kind of highlighted something interesting we found on the project is that as vulnerability uh, researchers, it's kind of easy to see what specific lines are causing the vulnerability without you know, seeing how the software works. But this means that actually trying to figure out how to fix it or even exploit it can be kind of difficult. Uh, with errors like this one, especially in the dwarf parsing, it was really hard for us to figure out specifically what in the dwarf was causing these weird out of bounds errors aside from, well, it's really messed up, so it causes a crash. Whereas from the perspective of the developer of the project, it's a bit easier to you know, understand what's going on. It's evidenced by a, the much better fix. <laughs> uh, next slide. Of course, we didn't just contribute this uh, one issue to fix a bug in Radar. We contributed a few other bug reports that were all kindly fixed by Pancake. Uh, most of these revolved around a lot of the dwarf errors we found, um, say checks uh, weren't being done if a string was null, accessing a memory that's out of bounds, one really weird one that was a stack exhaustion error. Uh, we have no idea what was going on there, but it's fixed now, so that's cool. Uh, and uh, all the you know issues we show on the screen here have been fixed. Of course, there's still a few more bugs to report and get fixed. Uh, we found a lot of bugs that didn't have to do with dwarf parsing specifically that we have compiled locally, but we still need to submit issue requests for so we can get them fixed. Okay, now for team conclusions, conclusion. Takeaways. So after only a couple of um, man hours, we were able to find you know, many crashes, which led to several bugs. This was particularly super cool to see since our team was mostly composed of undergrads. And I was under the impression myself that finding a bug would take a really long time, but actually only after spending a few hours setting up fuzzers and we were quickly on our way. Overall, the semester followed a very iterative process. Um, we started off with relatively dumb fuzzing that expanded upon a borrowed harness found on GitHub. But then we then evolved and added you know, address and memory sanitization and other features. And later we expanded to the 2D fuzzing mentioned before, which you know, mutated along the axes of both fuzzing, the binary, and the commands that it runs. We also improved our measurements of efficiency as the semester went on. In the beginning, we were kind of eyeballing which files the fuzzers touched, but later on, we had full coverage reports with AFL Cub. Um, one more important takeaway was deciding how to proceed based on the value that would be added based on doing certain work. Like Professor Jan said in the intro to this class, many groups focused on fuzzing new bugs instead of exploiting new ones. Um, we were prime culprits of that, to say the least. There isn't really any point in spending a lot of engineering and bettering the process of fuzzing if you already have like over 9,000 crashes. The team also grew familiar with Mozilla RR, which has a pretty big advantage over GDB in the sense that an execution is recorded. Then you can fast forward and rewind through that particular execution. This meant that debugging was a lot easier because the execution is constant. We don't have to worry about any addresses being randomized or stuff like that. Um, one more thing to note was that we did not pivot between targets like other groups did. We stuck to radar and we iterated and improved our process upon it throughout the semester instead of switching off of it. It's possible that switching to something a bit easier per se would have led to some exploits, which will kind of take us to the next slide, which is what we wish we had known. 
Um, we probably should have picked a target that's a little bit easier to at least build and tweak. Radar has a pretty relatively bulky code base and having to rebuild and compile even after our quick 30 patches would take quite some time. Overall in the class, we definitely did a lot more DevOps as a whole than exploitation. Again, we probably should have worked more on looking at the bugs found by fuzzing rather than continuously improving the fuzzing process. And then more on that, we kind of depended on fuzzing plus the automated crash walk to do a lot of the triaging for us. There wasn't much static analysis. I mean, there's tons of files in radar that we probably never even had a chance to look at. It's possible that our, we ourselves may have noticed something through static analysis that the fuzzers may have missed. So hopefully this is something that future students of this course can learn from and keep in mind. Well, I guess this has been covered uh, already by Jan's um, opening statement and, and just by Daniel right now. So I guess we can skip this slide. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you everyone for joining, listening to us. Uh, thanks Jan for running the class. It was a really interesting way to get our hands into an underlooked aspect of uh, vulnerability research. And we'd like to thank uh, Pancake for Radar2 and his help through like the community's uh, platform in Radar Ray. And spe special shout out to Crowell as well, who gave uh, really insightful tips uh, to us throughout the semester. Does anyone have any questions? Well, to quickly address one I saw in chat, um, the architecture is available on GitHub on the ASU vulnerability research uh, repository under, under team conclusion. I am not certain that this is public. Oh, really? We should check it out there. Maybe it is private. Yeah. It, it is group. private right now. Um, do you guys want to make it public live or do you guys want to clean it up and... Uh... We'll, we'll think we should about probably it. clean it up a little, yeah. Yeah, make sure the Kubernetes access uh, credentials aren't in there. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to check. Well, they are in there, so yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, uh, rewrite history, uh, wipe it, push it, and uh, I'll tweet out the, the link right now, and then um, when it's up, I'll tweet an update. Awesome. Oh, I saw a question about um, OBA0 as well. Um, yeah, so this is something that we saw on one of the harness we took inspiration from. And um, like the, the harness we that was documented was for Lipfuzzer and OBA0 was a way for to make Radar2 um, point at the right like section and in, in when when loading the binary manually through Lipfaza. And so that's something that was completely unnecessary when running through AFL. And so when we run it through AFL, we had this superfluous command that was run at the very beginning and that was kind of messing up um, the session we had. And so that's why it wasn't really pertinent from our security point of view, but it was still discovering bugs that were interesting for us. That's right. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, team conclusion. Let's see. There's a question on uh, the stream. What is a good way to automate to automate finding vulnerable functions in a binary for environments without a fuzzer? Um, environments without a fuzzer, I guess, like embedded environments where you can't uh, instrument the code and so forth. Um, automatically finding these types of bugs is tricky. So you can often pull out the binary and, and uh, uh, we host it into an analysis engine. That's uh, one route that people take. Another route is, is manual. Um, and a third route, I guess, is uh, kind of more experimental techniques like symbolic execution, which has its own well, problems. Static analysis in general. Static analysis, yeah. Static analysis although, in general. Yeah, right? Although there is a trade-off between precision and the number of false positives that you raise, but that's a really cheap way to, yeah, exactly. to and filter an down the, the right. things to have to look at. Yeah. An interesting thing um, with this course is uh, static analysis, like automated static analysis was very seldom used um, by the teams, which is interesting. I think it actually represents a gap in, um, uh, maybe there's a curriculum gap in that as well, right? In terms of, yeah, we, we have 
challenges for fuzzing, but not challenges for uh, these sort of static analysis tools that are out there. Actually, I'll, I'll take this opportunity for a quick plug. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, Fish Wang, is uh, running a binary analysis course at ASU next semester, um, which I think he plans to at least cover a little bit the, the, the static analysis, but I'm not sure it's his course. So we'll see. Cool. Um, all right. So um, eh, let's move on. What, uh, who is next? And uh, sorry, as uh, for those that joined between the streams or just joined right now, um, or between the presentations rather, um, the, uh, um, I'm uh, live tweeting this. So if you're interested in uh, seeing what happened before, what you missed, you can go and scroll through the, the tweet thread. Otherwise, um, this will also be up recorded afterwards on the VOD for on, on, on Twitch for a while. And I'll talk to the crew about making it available on YouTube if, if everyone's okay with that. And then, um, yeah, this is an outbrief of ASU's vulnerability uh, applied vulnerability research class, um, which is a follow on to Pwn College. I saw a question about that in the chat. Cool. All right. Um, let's uh, move on. Who's next? That'd be uh, Team Unconquerable. All right. Can we all see my screen? Yep. Yep. Looks good. Perfect. Awesome. So uh, we are Team Unconquerable, uh, consisting of Will Gibbs, Zion Basque, Robert Rokio, and myself, Stephen Peterson. Uh, we spent the majority of the time that we had this semester uh, looking at a uh, Game Boy emulator and trying to find exploits for that. So uh, we'll uh, talk about that, starting with target selection. Uh, this is the process we use to really um, dial down what we wanted to spend our time looking at and the kind of parameters we use for that. Uh, the first parameters were kind of laid out by the idea behind the class. It had to be popular. You couldn't just pick some something nobody used. That wouldn't be a terribly interesting target. Um, had to be security relevant. Uh, we didn't want to just pick something that, you know, you couldn't, uh, had to be able to be a foothold or be able to be some part of a um, interesting exploit there and had to be actively maintained. We were really interested in looking at something that um, maybe hasn't been updated for 20 years or something like that it has to be current and has currently um, re current ramifications as well. So um, we wound up deciding on a uh, Game Boy emulator. And we chose this one because we wanted to pick something that was um, kind of fun, you know, kind of always fun to mess with, you know, video game stuff or stuff that we may have used, you know, growing up. and. Um, it was also not so popular that had been, you know, fuzzed to death. It was, um, there's, we thought there might still be some uh, relatively low hanging bugs here we could find. It was, hadn't been already the subject of widespread analysis. And there were also diverse forms of input. This was really cool because it meant that if we weren't able to find something in one direction, we could, you know, go look in another direction or a different um, kind of input and maybe even find complex uh, interactions between these kinds of inputs. So um, after choosing our target, we uh, decided to look at previous CVEs for it, and we weren't able to really find any. Um, but we did find some stuff for other kind of things in the same space. And we you know, looked at those a little bit, thought that we could maybe glean some information and at least uh, let us know that we are on kind of the right track. You know, People have done this kind of thing before. And we also looked at the uh, attack vectors for this. This kind of goes back to the previous point where we were talking about various forms of input. Um, this is nice because, you know, uh, ROM file, we have different ways to input um, stuff into a different possible attack vectors, uh, namely ROM files, save states, BIOS files, and cheat files. Each of these could uh, have their own different um, uh, filters and different parts and talk to different parts of the actual code. So we figured that we'd be able to find some kind of bugs with at least some of these. Um, and here. And this was kind of our conceptualized security store. So we envision some kind of user who, you know, installs the emulator, wants to play a game, and they may visit a 
a shady online site, some kind, something that doesn't uh, bet the games they put up or the ROMs they put up or the cheat files they put up beforehand and uh, find something on there they want to use, you know, whether that, whatever that may be, any of the possible input um, directions would work. And they would intentionally download this ROM file or cheat file and load into the emulator. And this is uh, kind of cool because the actual ROM file would not be malware. It wouldn't necessarily be targeted by, you know, uh, security features on your computer, you know, in my, it would just be, a, it, for all intents and purposes, it would just look like a regular ROM file or cheat file or something like that. However, loading it into the emulator would allow some kind of security vulnerability, whether that be malicious code execution or arbitrary code execution, which is kind of the holy grail or something else that would allow um, some kind of access on the machine. And this is kind of what we conceptualize and um, now I'll go ahead and pass it off to Mahalas to talk about the fuzzing. All right, so I'm gonna talk about the seed selection and how we kind of did that. Um, so like my team already said, we had to pick seeds now for fuzzing this uh, Game Boy emulator. And two important things about picking seeds for when you're actually fuzzing something is that, and, and this is kind of a generic rule we followed, is that it needs to be small enough to make execution fast and mutatable fast. And it needs to be at a good starting point for fuzzing. Um, this kind of alludes to the question of what constitutes a good starting point. Um, and that, that I'll kind of touch on here. So the good starting point, you can imagine this as being a, con uh, a control flow graph that goes from left to right. I know this is somewhat controversial since the stack grows left to right as well. So here is my control flow graph growing left to right too. Um, here you can say the entry point is on the left and this kind of red highlighted box is some important state that we care about. So we kind of formulated through our group that an important state for vulnerabilities will happen after format validation. So you can imagine, you know, stupid things like the size, the beginning size of a Game Boy or the format of the Game Boy not being right, elf head headers being out of whack, you know, that kind of stuff. We thought it would be kind of trivial to validate. So we wanted to move to a point in the state that is after format validation. And so that is what I kind of targeted when I was trying to construct seeds. Um, so our seed construction uh, followed this general format for making stuff. Um, first, you started with the format specification, which you can find here about what Game Boy headers actually look like and what the whole Game Boy ROM looks like. So the rest of the seeds will be about ROMs. Um, then writing a real Game Boy Advance, I took a lot of inspiration from this blog right here. Uh, because they talked about interfacing with Game Boy hardware directly instead of using libraries, which if you've ever looked at Game Boy code, this is very not common. That's what I got to learn. Um, compilation, I used uh, Docker with the dev kit arm. Dev kit arm has Game Boy strippers that will allow you to strip an elf and make it a Game Boy ROM. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. And then lastly, execution or validation for the Game Boy, because I needed to validate that it would actually run at the end of my... Uh, golf game, you could say. So this is just any Game Boy emulator you want. I just picked one online just to check if it would work. So this is kind of moving on to the next part here, which is the semantics of Game Boy ROMs. If you're looking to make your own Game Boy ROM, it's pretty interesting. The way it works is you use C um, and some GBA libraries, which you could find in that Docker I mentioned earlier or in my repository, which is near the end of these slides. Um, you make some game and then you compile it with ARM GCC and that makes an ARM elf and that looks like an ARM elf that's just completely normal with normal code and everything like that, except it tries to access um, instructions or tries to access libraries and certain addresses that just don't exist normally in an elf. And that's how you know that it's a Game Boy. Um, so then the next thing that happens is the magic, which is stripping the elf header and replacing it with a Game Boy Advanced header. Um, and this is just like one script that you can find inside the Docker repo. It's pretty a nifty little script. And then the fifth thing, of course, is don't forget to put the Nintendo logo in the header. And this is real though. Like, like actually, don't forget to put the logo. If you don't put the logo, it's, it's not a valid Nintendo game. The first actual bytes of the ROM look like this. Um, 
and it's it is quite literally the Nintendo logo. You you have to put the Nintendo logo inside the elf header, or it's not gonna work. It won't be parsed by any Game Boy emulator, which I thought was pretty hilarious because looking into some of the history about this, so this is you know it looks like this. This is of course a corrupted Nintendo logo. Um, Nintendo added these bytes for copyright purposes so that Nintendo can sue knockoffs and things like that when you when you when you try to make your own ROM or you tried to like rip one. Uh, the Nintendo logo starts at the beginning of your game and that's the only way you could have a ROM. So yeah, and if you overwrite it before runtime, then you you get in trouble um, by the emulator. So this this I thought was at least kind of funny. But there is a workaround, which is changing the logo at runtime, because you do know where the ROM is loaded into memory. So after it is validated, you can, of course, overwrite it. So this is an image of overwriting that actual Nintendo logo by changing the first four bytes. Moving on to the next part. So this is where we start playing some GBA golf. We're making tiny GBAs. Remember, we're trying to make a really tiny GBA that will be mutated fast and can make for some really you know, fun, fun fuzzing. So I started with this templated GBA. You can find it inside that Docker container and it's quite a very normal GBA. All it does is it emits the screen and it puts some hello world onto the Game Boy Advance screen using all these libraries. Uh, of course, this big boy came in at about 68 kilobytes. Uh, for some of you, it may seem small, but 68 kilobytes is kind of massive to be doing thousands of executions per second on and changing this in a significant way. It's way too big to start with. So I did a naive cut and I just cut out all of the instructions. Um, and now we're left with 736 bytes, very tiny. Uh, of course, it's not good because for any Game Boy Advance emulator, you have to actually init the screen. There needs to be some screen action or it's just a broken GBA. And that kind of makes sense. So kind of from this a uh, little approach I did, you can already see that the conclusion here is that the libraries are taking up lots of space. Um, and that's because the Game Boy Advanced is statically linked. It's the Game Boy Advanced ROM. Um, and th that's for you know some, some good reasons because usually you don't have dynamic libraries on your Game Boy Advance. Uh, so they did it all statically. So I got stuck for a bit after that until I reread some of those blogs and I looked at how you can directly interface with the hardware. And because it's all specified where the Game Boy Advance ROM will be loaded, things like that, you can actually just directly interface with the IO RAM and the VRAM by referencing them as a pointer and then just setting things accordingly. So this little snippet right here puts one dot on the screen and loops, um, which was pretty awesome because this got rid of all the libraries because you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to interact with libraries to init a screen, but instead we just go directly to the hardware here, um, which was epic. And that brought us down to 764 bytes, uh, which was you know, pretty legit. That's really small. So then the next part here, I thought, okay, we already have a small Game Boy Advance uh, ROM there really is no reason to go forward anymore. It's pretty much just golf at this point. Yeah, pretty small. Um, but just to humor you, here is another way to make it even smaller if we just wanna play some theoretical golf here. Uh, the, the Game Boy Advanced ROM has a bunch of sections that just have zeros, just all these uh, null bytes. Um, so why not place instructions here? And I got inspiration from this for another blog that, that minimized elves. Yeah, why not you just throw some instructions into these zeroed areas um, in the header? And normally you're not supposed to modify the header, but these are all these null bytes are kept for if the developers ever decided to update the Game Boy Advance ROM style, but they never did. Um, for good reasons, because we've moved on to the Nintendo Switch and things like that. So you can safely assume that these bytes are, you know, you can overwrite them, do whatever you want with them. So why not play some instructions here? Pretty cursed, I'd say. So I introduced to you fuzzing as a golf service, as a GBA golf service, good stuff. So our fuzzer actually outperformed me. Um, I was trying to make some good GBAs and the fuzzer outperformed me after I gave it that initial small GBA. Um, doing stuff that I already told you about, like overwriting instructions are overwriting uh, the header with instructions and data in such a way that it doesn't corrupt the GBA, which is pretty hilarious because it beat me to the punchline. 
Um, so there it is, overwriting offset C0 and D0. And you can see them, you can see the fuzzer actually putting data and instructions in this area. Um, and if I, if I did have more time, I would show you what these disassembled things look like. But it is pretty interesting because the fuzzer didn't stop here. It, it got crazier as time went on. At some point, I think it made it down to an ELF that was like 400 bytes or something. It, or a, a Game Boy ROM was 400 bytes. It was ridiculous. So that was pretty awesome. So yeah, uh, the, this is playing golf with Game Boy Advance ROMs. If you're interested in it, you can find my little repo here, small GBAs that has some of these tiny GBAs I talked about, as well as a compiling chain, um, as well as our fuzzing interface called Fuzzer PH um, from the Anger kind of platform. We have all our binary stuff there, which I leads me into the next part, which is fuzzing harnessing. But again, if you're interested in any of this other stuff, go check it out. Uh, lastly, that I'll talk about for us is fuzzing harnessing and how we kind of harnessed after we had these tiny seeds. So our harness was base was extracted from the developers project first. It, we were lucky enough to find that the developer already had a harness, which made it easy for us to, to debug and change and stuff like that. So our initial fuzzing was on 40 cores with our Python interface, Anger Fuzzer. I added AFL++ support for it. And then our team added some other things as well. So go ahead and check it out. Um, but although we did add AFL++ support to Fuzzer, it, was, you know, it wasn't really needed. We ended up moving to HongFuzz. Um, and the reason we moved to HongFuzz was kind of a, a variety of things not working, like not getting crashes, because we did this for one week on 40 cores, and it wasn't quite enough. Um, so then our initial fuzzing with, was without sanitization, and we had almost no crashes. Uh, and then we added trace compare and trace PC, which is a type of sanitization which tracks the piece that the program counter and comparisons and this resulted in a bunch of crashes right after. Um, so yeah, use ASAN, use different uh, sanitization methods. They work really well and it worked really well for us. After that, we had around 50, 60 crashes. So we had 60 or so crashes on a, a Game Boy Advance emulator and it, it was pretty awesome. Um, so this is kind of what the harness looked like with the Python interface, because you can have our, the Python interface we have supports multi-core. So you, how, it's, it's really nice. It, it's like a programmatic way to interface with it. It's pretty awesome. So now I'll pass over the mic to our fuzzer selection um, about why we chose HongFuzz, how we ended up there. HongFuzz being our alternative to AFL++. Yeah, this is uh, pretty much just a reiteration of kind of what we talked about in the previous section. You know, we tried it with some different options, you know, LibFuzzer and AFL++. This especially gave us some difficulty setting this up. We had some issues getting it to full fork properly and some issues setting it up um, to run the uh, the emulator on, you know, in a, uh, in a on the cluster and stuff. And when switching to HongFuzz, was able to quickly uh, find crashes, even with the same input corpus. Um, so, you know, just sometimes just different fuzzers, different uh, procedures they may use for the mutation, they're able to quickly uh, find different kinds of errors in, in maybe the same software. So, um, not too much to add. Go ahead and pass it off now to uh, our triaging section. So yeah, my name is Robert Rosiot. I'm going to talk about the triaging section here. Uh, oh, hold on, hold on. Hey, hey, give me. Issue. Got an issue. Let me. Here, I got it, Robert. Stop moving the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> my bad. My bad. <laughs> Let's see. We're almost there. See, we've done. We've done it. There we go. All right, so my name is Robert and I'm gonna talk about uh, the crashes that we found. I'm really, I'm just gonna focus on two particular crashes that we found to kind of give a sense of our process and to give a look into some of the unique things that we found uh, through this process. So immediately after we got Hong Fuzz going, we, uh, we immediately started to see crashes. Um, I, think we, I think I got the Hong Fuzz up on, my, on like a two core, virtual machine and within an hour it had already started to, to put some stuff out there. 
Um, so after that, we immediately start rolling into the process of triaging the crashes that we found and trying to figure out what the root cause of those defects were. Um, so here you can see seg faults immediately started to appear. Uh, we went to, went to work assessing the security relevance for each of these defects. And one of the first and I thought more, more interesting ones that we found, at least initially, um, was we saw that it was actually crashing on one of these in a function that appeared to be reading or attempting to read from a Game Boy Pocket camera. Uh, which is really interesting because being an emulator, you're probably never going to be loading a, you know, a camera cartridge, obviously, into the emulator. Um, so it was interesting for us to see that this was even implemented um, within the emulator. So that was, that was interesting. We, but then we rolled into static analysis to try and discover what the root cause of the crash was. So within the ROM header, um, there's actually a number of bytes that kind of determine you know, different things about how the ROM is, is uh, used within the emulator. Um, and as you can see here, uh, this byte in particular actually determines the ROM type. And this byte here determines the RAM size. Um, so you can see down here the code where with the, if the value is FC, it actually sets the memory type to be a Game Boy Pocket camera. Uh, so seeing this, we then started to break down further into the code and kind of uh, use GDB to, to trace the execution through this. And we actually discovered something interesting, and that was that certain types of ROMs actually require that some external memory be allocated to the process. Um, but that's actually determined also within the header file. So if there's a certain configuration of a ROM, then what can happen is that when it tries to execute instructions, it'll try to access memory that's never been allocated. And that's exactly what you see here. Um, so immediately it hits this instruction, it tries to dereference this, it immediately gets a, a null, null dereference there. Um, the question, is it security relevant? Probably not. There's no apparent way to control the address uh, it, except to make it invalid. So you can obviously crash the emulator itself, but there's not really a, a strong security story there. Um, though we did find it really interesting because it demonstrates that if you start to look into some of those rare ROM types, um, those are going to be really good uh, places to start looking for bugs or defects, especially if you're using this to inform your static analysis. Um, that, that gives you a good place to find because that's going to be pieces of code that are going to be more infrequently executed and you can probably find unexpected program states there. So the next uh, interesting crash that I'll talk about that we found, we're actually, we actually call it the ghost crash. Uh, as because, and the reason for this was it, it, it cropped up, but almost immediately we started to have a lot of issues replicating the crash. Um, despite the fact that it looked extremely interesting to us because it was actually trying to call a garbage function pointer. Uh, and we couldn't immediately discover the cause because we couldn't get it to work on anything except one particular build of the game. Um, we could replicate the crash every time we tried on one build and never on any other. Uh, so what this meant was that we were going back you know, trying to figure out exactly how we had built this particular binary, how we compiled the binary this one time that caused this particular issue. Um, looking into it deeper, we found a couple of really interesting things um, about the emulator itself and the way that it does the file parsing. Um, one, it actually unzips every single ROM file that it receives using compression libraries and the binary actually counts on the fact that the compression libraries are going to return values predictably based upon what goes into them. Uh, so initially our thought was that we might have accidentally stumbled into a bug inside of either Minizip or um, one of the other uh, compression binaries that had been put into the, into the ROM. We, we determined we didn't think, later on, we determined we didn't think that that was the case. Uh, we do believe that what's actually going on here is the crash appears because of a particular system configuration at compile time. 
and it's not actually reproducible on any current builds. However, it, it could be still be security relevant if the compile time variables can be reproduced accidentally by a user uh, who's just following the instructions, then what you could do is you could actually achieve an arbitrary function call, uh, which, could be, which could be part of an interesting pr uh, proof of concept for, you know, for an exploit. Um, the issue also demonstrated to us that what have the, what, the variables of your system and your system setup at compile time are relevant if you're trying to figure out what the actual program state is. So besides just the inputs to the binary itself, the way that the binary is compiled uh, is, another, is another factor that you have to take into consideration when you are triaging and statically analyzing and trying to figure out what bugs um, are relevant and how, you know, what their root cause is. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Will who is going to talk about responsible disclosure. All right. Oh, I got it. Uh, let's see. All right, guys. Yeah. So now uh, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about our responsible disclosure process. Uh, if you just throw out some of our slides, uh, there were partially redacted function names and file names. And we haven't mentioned the, the name of this project. And that's not because we're leaving it as a surprise or for you guys to figure out, uh, but as a result of what happens during our disclosure. So let's talk about the good, the bad, and the buggy. Uh, so good, you know, the uh, we obviously decided to be responsible in our disclosure. Uh, we opened up a GitHub issue with uh, the project and let them know that we had found several possibly security critical bugs within their uh, emulator. Uh, and upon the, uh, opening this issue, the maintainer emailed us uh, and asked for, uh, you know, sample inputs and explanations of the bugs. And so we were happy to provide all that. And so we gave very detailed uh, uh, inputs as well as explanations of where the bugs were in hopes of helping them uh, resolve them in the project uh, as well. And this is a result of our uh, deep triaging process. Uh, but then comes the bad, right? Uh, like I said, we triage pretty deep. This takes a lot of time and a lot of manual effort. Uh, more time than you think that it would take, especially for some of these bugs on a large project such as an emulator. Uh, another issue with the responsible disclosure is that not all bugs that you find will receive CVEs. This doesn't mean that they aren't helpful, right? They improve the stability of the, of the project. But of course, the goal of this course is to uh, hopefully find uh, or hopefully get CVEs as a result of the bugs that you find. But sometimes that's not the outcome and that's okay. Uh, and then another possible uh, issue is the security impact of a bug is if you report it to the maintainer is ultimately decided by that maintainer. Uh, unless you submit it to an, a third party service like MITRE, uh, if the maintainer decides that, hey, you know, this isn't critical to our project, then they're not going to report a CVE. And I believe uh, one or several other uh, projects throughout this course also had something like this happen to them. Now let's talk about the buggy. And this isn't buggy in terms of, of course, we found bugs in the program, but this isn't buggy in terms of the program. This is buggy in terms of the human, the human interaction. Uh, so uh, part of uh, this, or part of the issue lies on us uh, when picking targets, right? We had our criteria nicely laid out, you know, a large project that is uh, relatively frequently updated and is used by many people. Uh, but we failed to foresee that some of these projects can have single or few uh, maintainers on them, which means that these maintainers are constantly working on these projects and are kind of stressed out uh, by the amount of work that they have to do. Uh, the maintainers also might be hesitant to submit CVEs for several reasons. Uh, including the fact that if they do submit a CVE, this alerts all package managers that there's some sort of security issue with the uh, project. And now the maintainer has to go through and uh, make sure that they're good with all of the package maintainers so that their project can then be distributed to them, uh, which can be quite a headache for them. So that's uh, that might not be something that they choose to deal with. 
Uh, something that we also have to do is pay attention to release dates for these smaller projects. Uh, because something that we ran into, uh, and it was just an unfortunate consequence, was when we filed for a or filed our issue on GitHub, it was the night before that they had decided to do a huge release of their software. Uh, and so this blocked them uh, as it could be a potential high severity bug in their uh, in their project. And they decided to wait for several days before they received all of the information that we have. Uh, and this also led to a possible lack of public recognition for bug fixes, as, a, as is what happened in our case, which is not only did we not receive uh, CVEs for the bug, which, as I mentioned before, is fine. Not all bugs are security critical. Uh, but the maintainer had also decided to go ahead and fix the bugs with the information that we, uh, we had given them and not give us any public rec recognition, which it can happen. Uh, but I think it's important that you know, if people decide to pursue projects like this in the future to keep this stuff in mind, because this can happen to you. Uh, and it's important to take the proper steps to make sure that it doesn't. Uh, so we have some we have some life lessons, some good takeaways. Uh, so first, ASAN, ASAN, ASAN. Uh, as we had mentioned, we didn't have many crashes before we started using some form of a sanitizer. Uh, and as soon as we did, we instantly got crashes. So if you're trying to fuzz something uh, and it's taking a while and you're not seeing any good success, try using a sanitizer. Uh, you might find more success than you think that you would, especially as, as simple of a fix as it was for us. Uh, triaging will take more time than you think, especially with complex projects. Uh, as Robert was, was detailing, there were several bite, single bites in the header that caused these issues. And tracing back to single bytes in uh, a ROM is not the easiest thing in the world to do. Uh, fuzzers can play golf. Uh, you know, you might, you might be surprised at how slim your input can be trimmed. Uh, we started with 764 bytes and we ended up with several hundred bytes less than that. Uh, so if you think your input's too big, trim it as much as you can and maybe you'll come out with the, something even smaller. And finally, not everybody's security positive, right? You might run into maintainers and people that just don't have the same mindset as you. Uh, and that'll happen. And the, the best thing you can do is try and make the project better for everybody and then move on. So I hope everybody learned something and thank you for coming to our presentation. Awesome, great job. Cool, let's see if we have any uh questions um on the chat i just finished my stream uh my my live uh tweet of the presentation all right let's see uh awesome cool all right no uh questions popping up on um twitch um no questions seemingly on Twitter either. That's great. Good stuff. All right. Um, for those that uh, joined us between uh, during the presentation, this is an <clears throat> out brief, you know, a, a semester summary of ASU's um, applied vulnerability research class that uh, we ran this semester. <clears throat> and uh, where the students found bugs in real software and it was super awesome. So we are down to last but not least, Team Airspace. All right, um, can you hear me? Yep, take it away. Okay. Right. Uh, Kyle, can you give me access to your screen? Okay. All right. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Gokul, uh, part of Team Airspace, along with uh, Jay Krishnaminan, Steve, Steven, and uh, Kyle. So uh, our target was PHP. Okay. Um, moving ahead. So uh, and I'll be talking about why we chose PHP and how we built a strategy to fuzz and find bugs. All right. Uh, oops. Yeah. So 
So PHP uh, is an open source server side language that is mostly implemented in C. There are some parts in C++ as well, and is powered by the Zend engine, which we'll be talking about later. Uh, the PHP code or script is executed on the server, which makes this an interesting target. One other advantage of this target is that this has multiple platform support, implying compatibility on different servers. Moreover, PHP has got a very good history of memory corruption bugs. PHP extensions. So PHP has got a good bunch of extensions and interesting ones are the ones that use parsing. And many of these extensions are not listed in OSS fuzz target list, um, which makes us, which gives us a lot of targets as well to fuzz. Uh, almost all the extensions are self-contained and has different entry points. Um, if you take a look at the, the uh, figure on the right bottom, uh, the, that is a chart uh, showing the number of bugs that were reported over the past few years. And th that is huge. So moving on. Um, so now let's talk about uh, how PHP works internally. First, uh, it passes PHP code to bytecode using Zend engine. And after that, it during runtime, it handles the built-in functions in both JIT and interpreter mode. And with the help of the extensions, it can handle various file types. Later, uh, last year, JIT engine work was introduced for performance boost. So uh, I'll be talking about the strategy that we had used. So the very first step we did was uh, analyzing the uh, the past CV reports, bug bounty reports, either from blog posts or bug bounty or bug reporting forums. We then went on to shortlisting targets based on the number of bugs found, what type of bugs they were, and the severity of those bugs. The very next step was to make the target ready for fuzzing uh, using some of the well-known fuzzers such as AFL plus plus, home fuzz, and live fuzzer. So these were used by the other teams as well. Uh, from the feedback that we got while after running these fuzzers, we designed a custom generation-based fuzzer. Apart from that, we had to manually analyze the code base. And this was done in choosing the, each of the targets, which I'll be talking about in the next slide. So as mentioned in the previous slide, while analyzing past CVEs, we found bugs such as heap memory corruption, use of uninitialized values, use after free, buffer overflow, underflow, then integer overflow. Uh, all these were the commonly found or reported bugs. And in the end, we came down to the, the, the four extensions, which are unserialized, PHP, GD, XF, and FAR. Oops. Uh, next, um, uh, Kyle will talk about the fuzzy basics. Over to you, Kyle. So because we have a very um, a complicated fuzzing setup, so I, I'd like to um, talk about the fuzzing basics first. Oops, uh, wait, what's going on? I can't, okay. So, so uh, how fuzzer works has been briefly talk, uh, talked about uh, by other teams. So I will just talk about the basic like fr uh, quickly. So we're still using some coverage-based fuzzer and we, um, which is basically generate random inputs and hoping that uh, random inputs can crash the target input. And because if it's coverage based, it actually uses the coverage information to help input generation, which can exercise the uh, edge coverage or ba uh, basic block coverage better to, uh, to exercise the functionalities in the target program. And then, we need to talk about a very important concept in fuzzing, which is a sanitizer, as talked about in the previous team, they use ASAM. And uh, basically a sanitizer instruments a target program and make it crash at un undefined behaviors. For example, in a, in a use of a free vulnerability, uh, it, it identifies the vulnerability by instrument, the free option and the memory access op uh, action so in the free action, it will mark the pointer as freed up when the free returns. And before it tries to access the pointer, actually any pointer, it will check whether the pointer tr trying to be accessed is freed or not. If it is freed, it, crash, it crashes and generate a nicely, nice human readable report. 
this actually sanitizers actually can help identifying bugs very um, in a very nice way. So we talk about fuzzing. Fuzzing basically generates a lot of random import, import uh, inputs and uh, fit them to uh, um, to programs. That means we need to fork, exec, and run code again and again. That means a lot of uh, computation power will be wasted on forking, exec, and running initial code, and finally spend a little time on the target function that we want to fuzz. So then some people came up with a nice idea, which is run the fuzzer. Instead of doing the fork exec, it fork it once and exec and run initial initialization code once and run it, the target function code again and again in a loop so that most of the computation power will be um, used to fuzz the target function. This actually increases the effectiveness of fuzzing by a huge margin. And another very important fuzzing concept, which is red queen or called input state fuzzing. It is designed to bypass magic number guard. Um, the details, uh, we actually use this technique in our uh, fuzzing setup. And for the details of how this is implemented, please refer to the Red Queen paper. So eventually for the fuzzing basics, this is the last part, which is input sharing. And it is an important part. It's, uh, it was proposed by Ian, Fa uh, Ian Fuzz several years ago, it basically says sharing inputs between different fuzzers can effectively improve, improve coverage. In their paper, they claim this number is actually 30%. We tried it, but it didn't, uh, it didn't work on our machines because reasons, because they were uh, implemented like several years ago. So we built our own input sharing setup to sharing inputs between FL, leaf fuzzer, and honk fuzz. Uh, to implement those, we basically keep two pools of inputs. One is dedicated for AFL, one is for, uh, it's actually shared between leaf fuzzer and honk fuzz. We implemented at the missing arrows here to allow the, a full input sharing bet uh, between the among the three fuzzers. Now we're going to talk about how we fuzz our extensions. Okay, next slide. Okay, to implement these various configurations of persistent mode, Red Queen, and input sharing, we set up Docker images with various configurations. We had one root Docker image configured with all of our tools, patches, and multiple compilations of PHP. Each compilation represents a different configuration, like you can see in this slide. And for each successful harness configuration, for example, like a JSON decoding harness utilizing Red Queen, we created a child Docker image that executes that harness automatically. And we set up a lot of these. So as far as PHP compilations, we have a nearly vanilla configuration we used to calculate code coverage, a baseline configuration used for benchmarking, again, to verify performance speed up to other setups. We set up a configuration with LLVM in persistent mode. And as mentioned, LLVM is the compiler level instrumentation, releases basic block transition. So you can use this to calculate code coverage and so forth. And an alternative LLVM and LTO mode that became our primary setup. LTO is link time optimization. Again, this has a cost of slowing down our initial compile time, but we gain from up to 25% increase in fuzzing speed and get rid of the problem of collisions and ed edge coverage. And as other groups have mentioned, the problem of edge collisions is that a large number of edge collisions can prevent your fuzzer from discovering new paths and degrades your efficiency of your fuzzing process. Again, we also set up compilations for Hong fuzz, libfuzz, and we'll get into later uh, the PHP IL setup for JIT fuzzing. Okay, next slide. Okay, we also created a large number of harnesses for different PHP extensions. This is, and we'll get into more of that in a little bit, each harness had been implemented in multiple ways for various activities. This example is just for one single harness, one that generates a P 
PHP archive data structure and fuzz the field. First setup we had was our generic shellcode implementation for the AFL fuzzer using AFL multi-core, which sets up one master process and numerous child processes for each core detected. And we use PHP in command line mode here. And this is again to take advantage of persistent mode. The harness code itself is standard PHP. You're allowed to use any code here that you can see in any PHP file on a web server. The next line here is our Python code, which is implemented as part of our Python script for input sharing. Third example is our corpus minimization command. And this had the opposite problem of AFL's persistent mode. We, it broke when using command line mode. So again, we implement this using a PHP file. Okay, next slide. We also implemented fuzzing harnesses using C code directly, such as this example here. This is again was to take advantage of the full power of Hongfuzz and libfuzz. Hongfuzz does have an AFL mode, but again, using Hongfuzz in this mode requires us to break the persistent mode speed up. And finally, we ran AFL cov as previously mentioned by other groups. And this was run continually taking up one core to constantly capture the coverage, line coverage and function coverage. Okay, next slide. The fuzzing process we followed was fairly straightforward. Again, we first came up with a harness, started fuzzing it, waited until the improvement of the coverage slowed significantly, took a look at the LCOV report and tried to see what code was not being exercised, make whatever changes possible to try to improve the harness take that output folder, minimize it for a new harness and start it up as input for the next session and repeat. And of course, do this for multiple harnesses, trying to cover many different areas. Okay, next slide. And as mentioned before, we analyzed AFL coverage for using LCOV. Here's an example of the code coverage map, again, for the new far harness shown earlier. Again, this shows and highlights exactly what sections of the source code and let you see what code is being exercised and which is not. Our coverage initially was fairly poor, but we kept improving it using various techniques. Uh, next slide. One of the techniques we did, again, is by looking at the code, writing down exactly which functions were not being covered, uh, figuring out exactly what actions were needed to execute and exercise code that was not being covered by our generic harness. Uh, next slide. And here's an example of, again, segments of C code harnesses that reach deeper into the code. Most of these don't have as wide code coverage as the generic data structure coverage shown earlier, but many of these reach small sections of the code, again, creating TARs, creating ZIPs, sections not covered by other areas easily by our generic harness. And you'll notice that several of these fuzzers have multiple instructions. One of the problems when creating a harness that calls functions directly is that certain functions obviously must be called in sequence to be valid. In other cases, you have complicated enumerated data structures, which must first be built by an earlier function before being passed off as a parameter to other functions. And if these conditions are violated, you can get false crashes that would only exist because the code was called in an unusual way that would not be normally occurring during regular program operation. Next slide. So to evaluate the effectiveness of each of these harnesses, uh, we ran a benchmark. We provided each harness roughly 16 cores and ran them for 24 hours. This particular approach and the numbers will show you have a few problems because again, they're somewhat dependent on our corpus and computing hardware and pure random chance. Major flaw with this table is that the speed of our pathway detection in a 24 hour period it's really only somewhat related to the number of pathways that could be detected. So in experience in a couple of these cases, we ran many of these harnesses far longer than the time shown in this chart. And in some cases, we could saw significant improvement. Because again, unless you reach the coverage limit of each harness, you're really only measuring how fast each harness is able to find new code coverage. To calculate paths, we used AFL's coverage information. To calculate edge coverage, we especially in cases where we had all three input systems running simultaneously. We combined all the fuzzers together, uh, minimized their output and used Hong fuzz to 
actually calculate unique number of edges. Okay, next slide. Here's the results of some of our more effective fuzzers in various different configurations. Again, code coverage is expressed during graph using graph terminology. Pathways are unique pathways through the code, which AFL came up with. Edge coverage is Hong Fug's determination of how many unique edges of the code tree that are traversed. And you'll see again, even in this chart, several major improvements if you see on serialize going from a full red queen setup to using this multiple input setup, we increased our path coverage significantly entirely due to Hong fuzz and libfuzz improving AFL's detection. Numbers in gray are sections where sometimes bugs or problems with our calculation procedure was breaking down, but it still gave us a result I threw here. And again, given unlimited time, many of these would have significantly higher coverage. For example, the JSON decoding, we ran to roughly around 8 billion executions. It was getting the 2300 path coverage instead of the 2000 you see here. Next slide. And finally, here's some of our other harnesses that were not as executed, not as successful, but again, came up with decent code coverage. Okay, next slide. So although we have a very fancy fuzzing setup and ran the fuzzer, ran the campaign for, um, uh, for several months, we still cannot find some real bugs in PHP extensions. We actually found some uh, bugs detected by uh, UBSAM, but they're not security related bugs. Um, so that motivated us to spend some time in manual analysis of the PHP code. So we did it. So for the target selection, we want to target something that is hard to fuzz because if it is easy to fuzz, it's probably already fuzzed by um, other people. And probably we want a target that is known to vulnerable and not too huge. And then we came up with this, this idea of just reading the uh, FTP extension of PHP uh, in one of the PHP extensions. It consists of two major uh, major file, one is ftp.c, which is actually the underlying FTP library and a PHP uh, underscore ftp.c. This is the glue between the PHP code and the C library. After some investigation, it looks like both of them are not vulnerable. So what do we do next? And after some investigation, we, we found out that actually there's some semantic information, a semantic difference between the library and the wrapper. Although the wrapper basically passed the PHP argument to C, uh, to, 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 to evoking the C functions, it actually uses the buffer differently from it is used in the library. As you can see here, the input buffer is actually right before a, a, a a uh, pointer, and this buffer is used as a byte point, a byte array in the library. So this buffer is a byte buffer, but it's actually used as a stream buffer in the wrapper, which causes some problem. And we can use this semantic semantic difference to leak the pointer right after the buffer by using by invoking by triggering, uh, triggering this error message here. So after some investigation, we uh, determined that this is an info leak and can be used for a PHP sandbox escape, probably for CTF purpose. And we reported it and it's classified as a bug, not a security bug, so no CVE. Oops. Okay, um, so then uh, we, one other thing that we targeted during our uh, execution, during our analysis of PHP was to look at the newly introduced JIT compiler. So uh, the PHP version 8.0, which was released in November of last year, uh, newly introduced a JIT compiler that was uh, supposed to improve the performance. It used the Dynasm project, which was developed for another Lua JIT project in order to generate the native machine code. 
jet fuzzing has been in uh, is an ex is, has been in existence for a while, although the Java Virtual Machine and other JavaScript engines were the most commonly targeted. Uh, Fuzzily is one of the most uh, commonly used JavaScript fuzzing engines, which uses a, an intermediate language called fuzzil uh, in order to perform its mutations. The fuzzil can easily be translated into JavaScript and the mutations and uh, that performed uh, that are performed on Fuzzil guarantee semantic correctness. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, that's... Okay, so uh, PHPIL was this other uh, tool that was inspired by Fuzzili and a basic... Uh, at the, a basic implement, a basic part of Fuzzili in Python that was intended at fuzzing PHP. Uh, as it is, it just supports code generation, but does not actually execute uh, any binaries or track coverage or even perform any sort of mutation on it. Uh, we used PHP AL and modified it a bit further and implemented an executor that would run PHP with uh, the input that was generated. We use Clang's sanitizer coverage that helps us uh, keep track of what kind of coverage we get. Uh, we also auto-generated the function signatures uh, of, uh, from PHP by combining static and dynamic analysis. We then use this uh, list of function signatures to target built-in functions in PHP, which does not, uh, did not exist in PHP IL. And then finally, we had our uh, we had our own PHP fuzzer, which we called Puzzle, uh, that can not that can fuzz the PHP runtime as well as the JIT engine. It still does not have any uh, ability to mutate the input, which requires a non-trivial uh, engineering effort. Uh, but we, when we ran multiple instances, uh, each lasting about twenty-four hours, we found a couple of bugs. Uh, each instance was using only one core and about eight GB of RAM. Uh, and it was able to find a null dereference and a DOS bug. We reported both of those, and uh, the they were actually we and these bugs are now fixed. Uh, a Dockerized version of the fuzzer is available, uh, and if anyone wants to try it out, uh, the null dereference bug happens because of a uh, unchecked uh, type error. Uh, we reported this, but it wasn't classified as a uh, security vulnerability. So, uh, so lastly, we ran a uh, puzzle for 24 hours to get an idea of what kind of coverage we get. And we see that over uh, ev after the five hour margin, every few minutes, we get a new edge that's detected, even without any sort of mutation. So. Uh, even even in this 24 hours that we ran it, it actually found five bugs, but they were not, they did not have any security relevance. So in conclusion, our target selection, wait, Oops. Uh, sorry. So in conclusion, target selection is critical. So our target, apparently our target is very hard and we only found three bucks in it and no, no CVE assigned. And we also concluded that AFL and or AFL++ is not the silver bullet. It cannot find bugs in all um, programs, but but a, fun, a fancy fuzzing setup is better than the vanilla vanilla AFL, and we're going to open source our harness and tools in the future. And any questions? All right, great job. I'm just finishing up the tweet of your conclusion. Um. Do you want me to uh, tweet a link of where it'll be open source? 
Um, the tools have been being open sourced, but we're going to push it to the class Ripple. Oh, awesome. Cool. So uh, that is the um, basically the last team, not least. Thank you, Team Airspace. Uh, let's catch up on Twitch. Awesome. No uh, specific questions on Twitch so far. Awesome stuff. So that um, is all five teams in this class. Um, to summarize. Um, the class uh, did real-world cybersecurity analysis. They picked real projects used by real people, a uh, wide range of project types and attack vectors and security uh, relevances and so forth, and they analyzed them. These are um, people, actually, let me switch you guys out for a second. Boom, we go full screen and it doesn't work. Okay, great, never mind. OBS fails. Um, yeah, the, the students that, uh, oh, I know, I, I can pin my video. Boom. The students that um, started this class, they, some of them had previous experience finding real bugs. Some of them had previous experience with CTF. All of them had previous experience uh, running through Pwn College, um, and now in one semester, they all have some good hands-on experience finding real bugs in real software. Um, I think one of the takeaways is that it's absolutely doable. You as a non-professional can absolutely find bugs, uh, look at software, and start down a cybersecurity path. Um, some of these students are graduating. If uh, you're interested in hiring them, let me know. Um, I will forward along um, any job postings. I know it's as hard to find uh, people to do cybersecurity work as it is to find good jobs to do cybersecurity work. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you for joining us in this stream. Um, students, thank you for um, being awesome all semester and pushing through, finding these cool bugs, writing these tools, uh, making this happen. And uh, special thanks to our visitors. Um, we would not have been this successful without them. Um, and a special thanks to viewers like you. See you next semester. <laughs>